More dope. Hello and welcome to Lore Dump, the show where Monty, Chase, or Neil take someone who hasn't experienced a game or game franchise and walk them through the full story. I'll pass you over to your hosts. I'm Jeff Thu, professional podcast cameo -er, signing off from my mother's basement. I'm... I... I'm sorry, what the f***? <laughs> Ex excuse me? <laughs> Gonna have to bleep that. Uh, <laughs> um, what? Yeah, so Just I, a little surprise for you. Yeah. <laughs> I reached out to uh, Mother's Basement to oh, ask... Oh, my audio is clipping all over the place. What? I reached out to Mother's Basement. Uh, Jeff, um, deep breath, get the inhaler. <laughs> asked, <laughs> I asked, I asked Jeff if uh, he would be willing to do a little, like a little intro. I flagged that um, I'm a huge fan of Mother's Basement, but I know that you are a bigger fan than I am, Chase. Um, so yeah, and he said, absolutely, this sounds cool and silly, no problem. In, um, so there you go. In a very amusing uh, twist of fate, literally today, before we came over I got my mother's basement U2's figure in the mail <laughs> oh, oh literally today <laughs> oh it was cute. I summoned him I put the effigy <laughs> on the mantel place and I saw I, I I materialized this into existence I willed this into existence Chase mother's basement knows your name that's yeah, yeah. slightly terrifying very <laughs> Very cool. I did also. Hi. It's important. It's important to say. I also sent as like an example of what we do. I sent Mother's Basement uh, the first Kingdom Hearts episode we did. So oh, he knows God. you as a narrator of the show as well. Oh no! Yeah. So um, <laughs> hello everybody. As friend of the channel, Mother's Basement said uh, because we can say that now. Um, this is Lore Dump, uh, the show where we take somebody who hasn't experienced a game and walk them through oh. the full story. Uh, I am joined, as always, by Chase, the American Hello. that's having a great time, and Neil. Hello. And uh, finally, finally, gents, we are covering Control. <gasps> so um, if you're new to the show, uh, we have covered many a game. Uh, we've walked through Metal Gear back when it was just you and me, Chase. Then we covered Kingdom Hearts because Neil hadn't experienced Kingdom Hearts. Um, and now, after completing all of those, um, I'm back in the chair. My name is Monty Zander. I'm your host today, and I am going to be taking the two boys through the Remedy Verse. We've covered Alan Wake, Alan Wake's DLC slash American Nightmare, Quantum Break, Alan Wake's Nightmare, <laughs> Alan Wake's Nightmare, and finally, we're here. The final Remedy game we're going to cover for now, Control. It's Beth. It's not Beth. It's Jeff. Jeff. Oh. Jeff from Quantum Break. Uh, yes. So <laughs> Courtney Hope plays the main character, Jesse, uh, who also plays Beth Wilder, one of the main characters of Quantum Break. They're the is, same person. Uh, Chase still believes that somehow we're going to get some big fat crossover. There is, there is no way that you could conceivably have a potential universe where Quantum Break is brought into the Remedyverse. Mm. And you have two characters with the same they're not, face. They're not necessarily well, the same universe, though, but. If they get the rights, it will be. Mm. Like, you know it will be. Here's the thing, because there's a good chance that someone watching this for the first time might be like, what is happening? When I say the Remedyverse, I've been using that term almost sardonically, but right now we've not had any official crossover. I've been using that in a, in a case of like, oh, and I've been teasing that, ooh, maybe Alan Wake might come back and be relevant later, but... As of right now, there has been no crossover, arguably. There's been Easter eggs and weird stuff where Alan might be creeping into other stuff, i.e. the Quantum Break game. He kind of creeps in there with his books and the game. But as of right now, again, we don't have much to go on as far as assuming that there's any crossover. Chase, you've had a running theory, it seems, that Alan Wake is going to appear in control as like a couple of collectibles, a couple of Easter eggs. W w where are you at with I don't that? think... Alan himself is going to, but I think, so, um, for the, for the context of this is I am more familiar with Control than I am with the other ones. I've played, let's call it the first half hour of Control, okay. I think, roughly. Maybe not even that. Like, I've not played a massive amount, but I'm at least familiar with the general concept, which, potentially, spoiler, is, to, to put it in somewhat layman's terms, SCPs. Okay, can you explain um, what an SCP I, is? I, I said that and I immediately went, SCP is not a layman term. <laughs> um, can I explain what an SCP, like, weird, 
Do you have a better explanation for an SCP? An SCP stands for Secure, Contain, Protect. Yes, but that doesn't explain what it is. Which is basically, it's 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 a collaborative internet effort to write fiction in the form of fake government documents on a web, which, which all live on a yeah. website. So, like, you could write one and I could write it's one, but like, it's all canon. It's like the, 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 the kind of things that would wind up finding themselves like, in conspiracy <sighs> things, like well, weird... Supernatural events that supernatural have to be, that have yeah. to be contained events, and documented. Entities, objects, etc., so I know that that's kind of what control revolves around. It's about the extent of what I know control revolves around. Yeah. And I do think that specifically, if you have an organization that studies these, I'm going to continue calling them SCPs, studies these, the lake from Alan Wake would be a known entity to that organization, it's I think. Fair theory, yeah. I think that there is, ve- especially given that, as far as I'm aware, we have confirmation um, out of remedy that these are the same universe as far as I'm aware. I've given you hints that that is the case. Yes. Yeah. For any um, for anyone that hasn't played Alan Wake, um, please please go back and watch our he- our video, which will be very helpful to you. Yes. Um, we will not be doing an Alan Wake recap of any capacity here, no. primarily because, and I, at the risk of giving too much away to you, Chase, I don't need you to worry or think about Alan Wake for this episode of Lore Dump. We will talk about that when we cover the Control DLC, which are going to be other episodes. Okay. Okay? What about you, Neil? What do you know about Control? I've played most of Control when it released. Um, Okay. I have a memory like a sieve and can remember sort of bits and bobs, but I don't want to say anything out loud because, well, for obvious reasons. Um, No spoilers. No spoilers. No. But uh, I don't remember the ending. I can remember why people are doing the things they're doing a little bit, but that's about it. Cool. Okay. Um, then let's start. Let's kick off. Control. Let's I'm go. I'm really excited for this. Um, so w- one thing I want to flag to both of you is I highly encourage you to ask as many questions as possible. Okay. I am not going to have answers. Guaranteed. Great. Excellent. But I do want you to I be... I love that. We I find do want that you to be very thinking. satisfying. That's... Yes. I-, I might have answers, but not to everything. Um, again, as always, guys, we are not a arbiter of knowledge on these uh, i am once again going to recommend friend of the channel gaming university link will be below if you want to really delve deep into serious possible theories for this we're just going to have a chat through the story and theorize as we go and i'll give you any information that i have as a big fan of this game i yeah. would just i would just like to preface for anyone who might be joining us and isn't familiar with our other episodes um we are Sitting while we record, drinking our adult juices, Delicious. Um, which we is, cannot reference exactly. This is what terminology that is required due to YouTube demonetization in the past. Mm-hmm. Um, to be fair, they've been getting better with it. They have been, but I don't want to take that risk again. Yeah. So yes, yeah, so, but we are all pretty much. Let's we can I think we can safely say we're all pretty half cut by this point. We've been recording for about six hours, so <laughs> we're going to dive right into it. So control, control lore. Oh God, I've literally written down, oh God, okay, oh no. <laughs> this is my Kingdom Hearts 2, Chase, all right? <laughs> so, so yeah, what I'm going to say is you're going to need to stick with me on this one because this is going to be one of the more complicated lore dumps that okay. we've ever done. Just because the structure of Control's lore is not straightforward. There are layers of stuff that's only really told to us through optional collectibles and things. So here's the agreement that we're going to make, and I include the listeners in this. I'm going to walk you through the full main story of Control, but I will occasionally jump to the side to tell you about some of the cool extra stuff that kind of adds dimension to the world and to the rules of this world. I will not be able to tell you all of the cool stuff, because if I did, this episode would be 20 hours long, and 10 of those hours would just be me reading government documents to you, and it's kind of the point of Control that the information is presented in a very mundane fashion. It doesn't make for great listening. So, listeners... If I missed your favourite AWE or OOP, if you're already a fan of the game, drop it in the comments below for Chase and Neil to read, because they legitimately will, they read all the comments, as do I. Uh, As always, I might get stuff wrong, because this is very complex, this world, and this game in particular, so corrections, as always, are below. Opposing theories are also really, really encouraged with this one, um, because I'm going to say some stuff that perhaps Gaming University, who really I I use as my basis for theories might disagree with me on and typically i go to him for any checking or any theories or any questions so just wanted to get that out of the way now controls world is awesome but you have to kind of meet it on its own terms so you'll see what i mean when we get into it so you ready mm-hmm. all right part one and i've called it there be work for the axe 
There what? <laughs> there be work for the axe. So as always with Remedy Games, we open with an eccentric monologue from our main character, in this case, Jessie Faden, the lady with the red hair and the leather jacket. This is going to be weirder than usual, she says. Can't be helped. We see a swirling, spiralling thing. It seems like Jessie is talking to whatever it is. You called me, she says. So here I am. I know I shut you out sometimes. I'm always glad to hear from you. It's just that... I get my hopes up. So many times it's led to nothing. I found nothing. It's like we live in a room and there's a poster on the wall. We stare at it and we think that it's the whole world, the room and the poster. It's like that movie, oh, what's it called? The prison movie? And the picture is different for each of us, but it's all a lie. You two are making faces at each other. What are you thinking about? I, I just think it's a bit of a dumb monologue. It's not a great monologue. It's, it's not, not their best. Idea. It's not their best. It's, uh... It's there. It's there. It's a prison movie. But yeah, so it's it's like that movie, uh, the prison movie. The prison movie. Yeah. The prison movie. Which prison movie is you that? Can't remember what. Shawshank. I mean, I assume. I'm assuming that it is um, uh, what you call it, baby, by Lil Nas X. I'm gonna. Uh, That's uh, the prison in, movie. Industry baby. Industry baby. I'm gonna assume that it's the prison from Paddington Two. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> the pr- what's the movie? What's it called? Okay, but Paddington, Paddington Two doesn't have hot nude men on, in it, so you know I'm I'm gonna stick with my theory. Oh, uh, it has Brendan Gleeson as an older chef. Ooh. Yeah. Anyway, so she's like, oh, it's like that movie. There's a poster on the wall, it's like the prison movie, and the picture, the poster, it's different for each of us, but it's all a lie. A series of quick shots cut in o- into focus over Jesse's speech. A picture of a building. A bespectacled man in a three-piece suit grimly sitting behind a desk. That's a disgustingly boring building, but it also looks like half the government buildings in DC. Mm -hmm. So I can't complain. Mm -hmm. It's true to life. So yeah, a bespectacled man in a three-piece suit grimly sitting behind a desk. A black upside-down pyramid set against a white void. A bald man in a grey jumpsuit. Back to the bespectacled man. He places a gun to his temple. Also, is his glasses broken? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. Yeah. They're lying to us, Jesse continues. Those are some nice glasses. I really like them. They are, yeah. You're going to notice a lot. A lot of control is very sexy looking. The, I will say now, the, the, you kind of mentioned the buildings and the kind of look of the building. Mm. The the design of the world is fantastic. Mm, yeah. The design of the spaces is amazing. I think you even got to that, Chase. Just seeing some of the brutalism on it, it's yeah. just beautiful. All of the games in Remedy look great and have a lot of stylism. Mm. They cranked it to 11 in this game. They did. They did. Um, So they're lying to us, Jesse continues. We're lying to ourselves. The room is not the world. The world is much bigger and much stranger. There's a hole hidden behind that poster leading to the real world. And sometimes, sometimes, something crawls out from behind the poster. The ones that see it happen freak out. They try to forget what they saw. I was 11 years old when I first saw behind the poster. They told me I imagined it. I've been trying to pull it down ever since. We finally see Jessie, played by Courtney Hope. She enters the building. It's called the Oldest House. It's the headquarters of the FBC, the Federal Bureau of Control. Wow. Why did you bring me here? She asks the spiraling thing that we saw at the beginning. She can immediately feel something in this building, some presence. She says that whatever it is, it resonates. We learn that she has a name for the spiraling thing. It's called Polaris. It seems to be something that she can see out of the corner of her eye, signaling silently to her. She can pick up vibes and traces of feeling from it, but the two can't communicate verbally. She's vibe checking Polaris. 100%, yeah, the two vibe check, yeah, all the time, <laughs> constantly. And you, you will get this as you play as well. You'll see her, like, flash in the corner just for a split second, almost like you've missed it, it's so fleeting, but she'll typically guide you to objectives that way. It's very clever. You have to be, like, on the lookout, but any shift or change, like, Polaris is guiding This you. is absolutely weird. Way too early to be asking this question. Hit me. Um, is Polaris an independent entity, or is it something within? Like, like is it a, is it Jesse? You're definitely not getting an answer right. Now. I know I'm not. So I want to just put it out there. <laughs> that I'm thinking about it's it. A great this question. Way too. I, I already said it was way too early to be asking that, but I want to ask it. Regardless, I'm here for it. You, you, want it on, you just want it on record. Yeah, yeah, it's on record, and you're not getting an answer right now. So. <laughs> 
The main lobby of the oldest house is empty, deserted. Jesse travels through the offices, noting how thick the concrete walls are, how there are just sheaves of paper scattered all around. It's eerie. It doesn't look like anything ripped through here. It just looks like everyone kind of vanished. So she's been looking for the FBC, quote, all of these years. I was hunting for them, but they were hiding in plain sight. She's been looking for a federal bureau. Yeah. You go to DC... You, you submit a freedom of information request, mm -hmm. and you go to their building. Who's to Surely say, they're on Google Maps. Who's to say the FBC is, like, logged anywhere? It's a secret governmental organization. I'm sorry. You have a massive, brutalist building. It's a magical yeah. building. You go straight yeah. in the door, and mm -hmm. FBC is written both on the wall and the floor. You're hitting the nail on the head there, Chase. It's, it is odd that it's taken her this long to find it. But, uh, yeah, it is explained. So, uh, turning a corner, she sees... This guy, Atty. There you are, J Atty says. Oh, no, 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 he's fin it's Finnish. I, I, I'm allowed to do Finnish. <laughs> I just, look, he's not even Finnish. He's, uh, bear in mind, Remedy's a Finnish studio. Yeah. So uh, it's important to note that, like, he's not, he is Finnish, but, like, he's just kind of got this, like, ethereal accent. It's not even direct, I wouldn't even say it's Finnish. Are you we know? saying the Finnish are ethereal? No. Well, I don't know. You know, remedy are, are a lot of things. But um, no, uh, it's just, but that's what he is. So he's like, there you are. He's absolutely mopping the flop. Uh, mopping the flop? <laughs> <laughs> he's mopping the flop. He's absolutely mopping and the flop. And speaking about the flop, those headphones are a flop. What are those? It's important to know he is listening to music. We can hear almost like rock music like come out of them, but we don't can't pick up exactly what sort is of it, rock. Is it the old Norse gods? From what? The, from Alan Wake. From Alan Wake. The, the old poets of Asgard. That's no, no. the ones. Uh, so yeah, so he's listening to music. The boys. Um, and he's like, you are here about the job. Janitor's assistant. You need to go to the interview that way. I'm Atty, the janitor, by the way. Tell them I sent you. If they don't hire you, uh, there'd be work for the axe. Take them behind the sauna. Jomalota. That's finished for God help them. Shomalota. <laughs> yeah, so he's like, take them behind the sauna. God help them. Also, if they don't give you the job. Are we trying to imagine <laughs> that there is one janitor for an entire federal bureau building? Well, to be fair, yes. he's interviewing for an assistant. I will tell you right... Yeah, I'll also tell you right now, yes, there is one janitor for this entire federal building. Atty is the only janitor. If this place isn't covered in grime, then I, I refuse to suspend my disbelief. Well, right, so, so Atty's a little bit weird, clearly, right? He's got something going on, and Jesse is like, oh, he seems nice and just heads the way Atty pointed. But that way just leads back to the lobby, which is strange. Did she take a wrong turn? No. It's almost like the oldest house moved. Well, into the elevator she goes. She finds it eventually, up through the building. Jesse thinks how it's been 17 years since the men of this bureau, this FBC, took her brother Dylan. Her goal is simple, find him. But that goal will need to wait because, bang, a gunshot rings out. She races towards the noise, entering the office labelled Director Trench. Are we assuming that the director's office is right near the entrance? No, she went up the elevator. Oh, one elevator. Went up, I don't know, ten floors? I don't know how many floors it went up, just went up a lot of floors. So regardless... With no there. key card on the elevator. It's a magical <laughs> building. It is a U.S. federal governmental building. It's a magical building. I don't care how magical the building is. If it is a U.S. federal building, it will be covered in layers of security. Anyhow. <laughs> You're not allowed to say that. That's my thing. So, she opens the door to Director Trench's office and she immediately sees the body. Director Trench, head of the FBC, sprawled out on the floor. A strange looking gun next to a pool of blood. She picks it up. As soon as her fingers touch the cool metal, a flash, a vision, a transmission from the black inverted pyramid. We are broadcasting from the pyramid, muffled voices say. And when I say that, it's like, you can't hear exactly, you can't hear them speak. The only way we know what they're saying is because of the subtitles. So we are broadcasting from the pyramid, muffled voices say. We are the board. The gun. Only the director can wield the gun slash sword slash intentionally left blank. Your application will be processed. Oh. And then flash again. We see an old projector rattle somewhere deep in the house. It's uh, like a PSA, like a public service announcement for the employees of the bureau. Time for the game to explain a little more about what the hell is going on. So, we see this guy, Dr. Casper Darling, played by Matthew Aww. Peretta. Oh, he, he looks, looks fun. Yeah. He looks... He does look fun. Yeah. He's also the voice actor for Alan Wake. 
He looks like he brings fun treats in on Friday for his employees. Wait, you know, for his... For yeah. The voice actor. He's the voice actor. Remember, there's a voice actor, and then there's a mocap double, and the mocap double... Oh, because yeah. Alwake is Finnish, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, yes. The, yes, the, 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 the actor is Finnish, so we have an English voice. Uh, Il- Ilkavili is the body double, cool. and he's the voice. So he's the guy that does, like, the reading, the narration, all that stuff. Brilliant. So. Cool. He's giving me Gail Bettiker Breaking Bad vibes. Oh, uh, darling's a peach. He's he's just a, a, a oh, he's a legend. He's a peaches, peaches, peach, peach, peaches. <laughs> Sorry, when, I went to see the Mario movie last night, and that song's been stuck in my head. So anyway, so Doctor Casper Darling, that's he is Doctor Darling, um, and he's like, oh, objects of power or OOPs can cause or be results of yeah, oops. Um, yeah, or, or oops, can cause or be results of altered world events, otherwise known as AWEs. Altered world events, Oz, cause OOPs, objects of power. Okay. They are intrusions on our perceived reality, he says. The service weapon is a prime example of an OOP. So it's the gun that Jesse just touched, the service weapon. A very powerful one. It's a key component of our prime candidate program. Come out of that Russian roulette a winner and you're it. You're the new director. So that's kind of the the takeaway here is that Jesse has walked in. To a job interview. Yeah, exactly what Ati said, Janet Torres' assistant, except she's actually about to become the director of the FBC. Trench died, the previous director. She picked up his gun, the service weapon, and and the board almost did a quit like your application is being processed. Will you become the next director? Let's see. So that's what it is. But Jesse's like, I don't know what's going on. So Jesse is flashed into a wee tutorial level uh, in this white void. Huge black obelisks act as like platforms for her to leap across. It's just a quick bit of tutorial. Um, But when she does, she can almost like... Out of world tutorial, you hate those. I do. In this context, I hate it less because it's the only exposure we get to the board and the void and this ethereal astral plane. Um... Mm -hmm. So yeah, so but all you're doing is just running around, you're jumping, blah, blah, blah. Um, and this is where Jessie gets her powers. We'll come back to you a few times as she unlocks more powers across the game. So yay. Um, so quick thing on gameplay. Over the course of the game, Jessie will find and interact with certain objects of power like the service weapon. When she does, she can almost like tap into them. So for example, there's a, uh, a floppy disk that is pulsing and making objects fly around a room. She looks horrified by the floppy disk. Yeah, it's like really painful to try and tap into, but when she's done it, whoosh, she's got that power. Um, so she almost like sucks the power off of these objects of power. Mm. Is there oh, a reason? Can disc. anybody do that? No. no. Only certain people can. The floppy disk gives her the power, incidentally, to store 512 kil- <laughs> kilobytes of information. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, no, the, 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 the floppy disk actually... Um, it's a slight boost of the short-term memory. <laughs> it actually, what it actually does is it lets her, like, launch objects at enemies, and honestly, that is the coolest part of the game. Well, sir, the sir, that's game not what a floppy disk does. No, but the idea is that this is the... I'll just tell you now, uh, this is the floppy disk <laughs> that held some of the codes for nukes on them back in the Cold War. And because of that, and I won't, exp- I won't get into too deep a why right now, but we'll get there. Uh, the idea is that because of that, I mean, it was it was literally to launch nukes. So she learns launch from it. She can launch objects at people. Okay. That's, okay. That's okay. That's I cool. do- I'll give it a pass. I like that. Yeah, um, so yeah, cool. really, really cool. And honestly, like the, the 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 particle effects and the way that launch works, it evol- it turns the game from like this is kind of cool to and weird, and I don't really know what's going on. So like, ah, oh, blow it, blow it up, blow it up. <laughs> like you're yeah. just because you're throwing like printers at enemies and it's bits of. Cool. bench and stuff and by the end of a combat arena the, you'll be finding like just an office and by the end of it the office is just trashed uh, so yeah so she finds like a floppy disk that gives her launch or a, a carousel horse uh, that's weirdly like flitting around a kaleidoscopic room uh, that gives her the ability to dash uh, I don't remember what the carousel horse is why it's why it is the way it is but it's the same sort of idea it was like once a thing that had a thing and now she can touch it uh, just like the floppy disk with the nukes so Items that have had sp- significant events, mm. spooky, weird, magic stories, and they've been imbued with properties. Yeah. So, yeah, so the carousel horse, that, that lets her dash, right? Um, the service weapon that Jesse's picked up is alive. It twitches. It reshapes itself. It can transform to, like, a sniper or a shotgun or a machine gun, grenade launcher. You get the idea. Um, completing the tutorial level, we hear the board's muffled voice again. Congratulations, Director. 
you slash we wield the gun slash you. The board oh. appoints mm. you. Mm. So like, either you wield the gun or we wield you or... No, 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 no. We wield the you. We wield the you. Good we point. wield the you. <laughs> um, the board appoints you. So Jesse's officially been made director of the FBC. After all of this, uh, so she's been like whirled around, the board speaking to her, she's found a dead guy, she's picked up a bloody gun, was thrown to the astral plane for a tutorial level, and then she flashes back into the office, and she stares at the gun, and she stares at Director Trench's corpse, and she goes, I'm happy. Happy to be here. And that's literally what she says. <laughs> anyway, that happiness doesn't last long. Um, as she leaves the office... Uh, she sees an eerie red light at the end of a corridor. In fact, the eerie red light just kind of like encapsulates the entire building for a, ble- a brief second. Yep. Uh, the source of the light, uncertain, um, but it just happens. Three silhouettes levitate in the distance. Immediately, Jessie's head starts to pound. A pulse washes down the corridor towards her, and it is agony. Something is screaming at her. We can't hear it, only she can. Hate, she mumbles. You can't let this happen. Out of me, you can't. What? But then... Come. We see Polaris flicker. It stopped it. Whatever it was, Polaris held it back. The pain is gone. The levitating silhouettes drop to the ground. They're clad in uniforms of the FBC, and they open fire immediately. We pick up slips of the sentences that they are babbling. They're almost saying them like rhythmically, like, like an incantation. So, and here is a snippet that I've managed to find. Um, it is pretty much the same stuff every single time. There's never a variation. And they're saying, You're a worm through time. The thunder song distorts you. Happiness comes. White pearls, but yellow and red in the eye. Push the fingers to the surface into the wet. The egg cracks and the truth will emerge out of you. The egg? The egg, yes, the time egg. And you want to say that Quantum Break isn't tied to this? It is, just not explicitly. There's inferences, and I'm glad you're picking up on them. Um, <laughs> I'm glad that the egg is now a confirmed reference to Quantum Break. <laughs> like, no, no, I, I don't know if it is, but I read it as a reference personally. Um, so yeah, the egg cracks and the truth will emerge out of you. All hair must be eaten. How do you what? say insane? An earworm is a tune you can't stop humming in a dream. Baby, 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 yeah, the last egg breaks now. So that's a snippet of what they say. That's basically, and they basically say that on repeat. The Sam Lake like eggs, do you think? What I will tell you is that we find out why they're saying that. Mm. Oh. Not necessarily today. Jesse finds it contagious. It burrows into her. but Like Polar- an earworm. Like an earworm. Yeah, absolutely. It's, yeah, yeah. So Polaris keeps it from taking her over, though. So whatever this is, it's like the hiss is almost trying to take her over, but Polaris is able to hold it back. It and the hiss me. is a word you haven't said before, I don't think. Is that what this is called? Jesse nicknames these enemies the hiss. She just does. She just goes, it's like it's hissing. The hiss. They're the hiss. That's what we call them. The hiss. It's Jesse's name. Uh, is, is the kind of inference there before, do you think that when she had the headache and the voice in her head, would this have probably happened to her if, if Polaris hadn't been there? Would yeah, she have 100%. become one of these kind of zombie people? The only reason she is not like these people, these FBC who have been taken in a sense, uh, is because of Polaris. Yes, that is the case. Go yeah. Polaris. I don't need to doubt you anymore. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, but whatever the hiss is, it's clearly taken over the FBC employees. So, welcome to our enemies. All right. I can tell is that the uh, Federal Bureau of Control seems really bad at controlling the things in their building if they're... Well, you know, it's, it definitely seems point, like is. something has gone wrong here, yeah. doesn't it? Director shot himself in the head and there's no one around <laughs> except these. Like, this doesn't yeah. seem like a normal day in a place that I can imagine has a lot of not very normal days. Yep. Yeah. So... Jessie fights for the hiss, uh, she shoots them, you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, and she eventually makes it to Central Executive, which is basically our hub for the game. We will come back to here oh, okay. quite a lot. It's the pyramid! The pyramid. This room is where I got to. That's pretty much, that makes sense. This is the opening. Once you've got here, you've completed the opening. Yeah, that's, that's where I got to and then I got bored. That's fair. Oops. Um, yeah, like, well, yeah, I mean, like, there's a point where it's like, there's just such an overwhelming amount of weirdness that you go like, I don't really know what the hook is, other than, this is weird, can I learn more? But you're just thrown with such a barrage of information that it gets to the point where it's like, I don't know where the hook is That's the thing, is I, I want to go back and play it, because I feel like, I feel like I never actually got to the weird, mm. in terms of, like, the individual mm-hmm. weird artifacts and stuff. Yeah. Because there's nothing, by the point you get here, you fight some hiss in this room, and the yeah. pyramid's there, and... I think it's just the weirdness of the presentation, right? Like, Jesse's kind well, of weird monologue and what is Polaris? I think personally, and... the reason I gave up is because I just don't like shooters. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> I just don't like shooters, so the gameplay bored me. Yeah, once you get launched, the game changes. 
I think everybody should get up to launch, try launch, and if launch doesn't hook you as a gameplay mechanic, then don't bother. Um, because the game doesn't... It, that's the that's the peak of the combat, is using launch. Because uh, it is awesome. Anyway, so, Jesse fights through it all, gets the central executive, this weird hub um, in, like, the center of the building. Um, there's a huge black inverted pyramid that hangs from the ceiling. Some satellite dishes sit in a circle. Technology here that was once trying to do... something? We learn through collectibles that the oldest house is two things. The first is that it's bigger on the inside, as you'll soon see. Very TARDIS-esque. Um, and parts of it can change shape and size at will. I mean, if you're looking at this, you'll see it's all very ge geometric. This is actually a point in the game where, and I don't know if you remember this, Chase, but where Jesse's able to almost cleanse this and all of these blocks will move back to reveal a room. But the, the oldest house can just change at will. It could change the size of room, it could change the locations of rooms if it wants to, it can do whatever it the wants. The insurance on this place must be mad if yeah, you work yeah. there. I'm sure that the magic board and the pyramid are dealing with it. Mm, mm. They probably have some magic insurance. Like hazard pay, I mean you can only imagine mm. it's, it's through the roof. So you learn through collectibles that these satellites in the middle, this this cleansing point almost, um, is called a control point in the game. Um, and the FBC have set these up throughout to stop the house from changing at key points. So like central executive okay. needs to stay the same. Some of the labs have them. Uh, for us, there are checkpoints. There are bonfires, Dark Souls cool. style. Um, if you die, you go back to a control point. Basically, that's all good and well, but the Hiss have destroyed a lot of these control points, which means that the house is now just, like, losing its bloody mind. It's, it's shifting and shaping all over the place. Um, but Jessie can fix them if she wants to, and we're encouraged to, so she can explore freely. A nearby bunker opens in Central Executive, and some FBC employees were hiding in there from the Hiss, and we get to meet best girl, Emily Pope. She's the best. I love her. Um, she comes out of it. It's important for me to note, I think, that the, the bunker she steps out of doesn't seem to be made necessarily of metal. It's almost made of, like, black rock. Like, really, really shiny black rock, but not metal. Kind of obsidian. Obsidian is perfect. Yeah, absolutely obsidian. Um, just important to note, might come back to it later. Uh, so Emily Pope steps out. Uh, she's a research specialist who worked under Dr. Casper Darling, the guy who did the PSAs, Alan Wake's voice actor. She's also our fantastic resident lore dumper. That is her job. Oh, nice. She's here to explain. So she's immediately our favorite. Absolutely. Emily Pope is the best character in the game. Um, I love her a bit. So Pope is like, oh my God, thank you for saving us. Who are you? And Jesse's like, I'm Jesse Faden. I'm just visiting. And Pope is like, oh, you're... No, you're not. You're the new director. Let's get you up to speed. Somehow, this hostile force has managed to infiltrate the building without any warning. And she looks around and we see, as she says this, pictures on the walls of Jesse in like almost sitting behind the director's desk as if the oldest house has shifted in response to Jesse being named the director. Okay. So that's quite cool. Um, and that's kind of how Pope is able to tell. She almost sees one of the portraits and she goes, oh, cool, yeah. two and two, you're the new director, no problem. Mm. She doesn't seem to question what happened to Trench. <laughs> she just doesn't seem to care. I, I suspect they're maybe used to it. Um, employees going, going bye bye. Um, is it worth pointing out that em is Emily? Emily. Emily Emily's Pope. wearing a kind of harness mm. around her chest, a sort of electrical setup and a, a sort of black box. So that oh, is called a Hedron Resonance Amplifier. Okay. Uh, Emily tells us this during this very conversation. She basically refers to it and she, and she says that, and then she indicates to the vest and she goes, uh, HRA, sorry. And we see that uh, a, a lot of the other people uh, around her, some of like the, the grunts, uh, they're all wearing HRAs as well. Okay. It looks like, like you could slot a cannonball in there real nice. Uh, you yeah. absolutely could. But yeah, so she basically takes, it, she, she indicates the metal vest. She's like, we're in full lockdown. It seems to have spread everywhere in the building, affecting everyone not protected by a HRA. And she says this and that's like a massive monologue. And then she kind of stops. She goes, sorry, I'm talking a lot. And Jesse explains that Director Trench is dead. Uh, that doesn't seem to surprise Pope. Uh, she's more curious as to how the hell Jesse got into the building if it was on lockdown. Because they locked the building down. Jesse shouldn't be able to get inside the oldest house. Okay. Jesse thinks that Emily seems all right. Nothing like the faceless agency she's built up in her head all of these years. But she's not ready to tell her about Polaris just yet. She's like, I'm, I'm, I can ask some questions, but I'm not ready to reveal yeah, too that's much. That's not one for new friends. No, she's not. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so Pope's like, how did you get in? And Jesse's like, oh, a janitor let me in. And Pope bursts into laughter and she's like, love it. This is unbelievable. Look, you probably have a million questions. You're the new director, so hit me with your questions. I do remember her. I liked yeah. her a lot. She's the best. Um, so Jesse like licks her lips and she's like, listen, 
The bureau was involved. And it, she, she, she what? Just like, like, just a get ready to talk sort of thing. It's just, look, I didn't want to say Jesse says or Jesse's like in the script, okay? <laughs> this is a weird way to start it. Wait, you, no, not like that. Shorp. I mean, I ship these two, so <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, Maybe she I does mean, lick her yeah. lips. Oh, stop that. No, no she, she can lick her lips all she wants to. So listen, Jesse says, the Bureau was involved in an incident in my hometown, Ordinary, 17 years ago. Oh, it's back. It's the third. Is this the third Ordinary reference now? So, uh, do, can, can you, for the listeners who might have just jumped into control, can you explain where we've yeah. heard this before? Oh, do you remember? Okay, so, so the first time we heard it was on the back of Alan Wake. There was some blog that popped up, and I don't remember all the details, but there was like an eerie amount of things that they shouldn't have known yeah. about Remedy and about Alan Wake. The shoebox specifically. She got yeah. delivered a shoebox in yeah. her dreams, but then it appeared, and then she had a dream where it was there, but then it disappeared. And you might remember a faceless government agent appeared one day with AWE on a tag. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I don't remember that. Which part. is interesting because now we know AWE is Altered World Event. At the time, we joked that, oh, Alan Wake experience or something. And that was the theory at the time, mm-hmm. but now it means Altered World Event. She lived she, in Ordinary. She was from Ordinary, was yeah. where that first one was. Yeah, and then the second time we heard about Ordinary was in Quantum Break. They mentioned somewhere that there were incidents in the towns of Ordinary and the town of Derry. Yeah. Yeah. Which is also the biggest reason why you can't tell me this isn't the same universe if Ordinary exists in Quantum Break. Well, get there, man. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, yeah. Yeah, keep sticking with that theory, Chase, because something's going to happen. The same place can exist in different worlds. No. <laughs> okay, <laughs> fine. <laughs> no. Uh, so anyway. So yeah, so so Jesse's like, look, the Bureau was involved in an incident in my hometown, Ordinary. I'm from Ordinary, 17 years ago. You came in, covered the whole thing up. What can you tell me about that incident? She doesn't really give too many details. Remember, all we know is that she's here looking for her brother. She's got this weird thing called Polaris with her. And something happened in Ordinary 17 years ago. I feel like that's also very presumptuous to assume that this random person at the agency you just met Mm. definitely knows about this specific incident. As if everybody's going to know everything the agency has ever done. It's a bit like going into a sort of massive restaurant and going... I was served here 17 years ago. <laughs> what do you remember about my order? There were different yeah. owners, the menu is different, <laughs> but you will tell me exactly what I ate. We're, we're, well, take, we're taking the mic, but I bet she does know. No. Uh, she probably, she, I mean, she is the resident Lord Umber. <laughs> Pope, yeah, Pope shakes her head at that. She's like, I've seen mentions of an altered world event in like some classified files and stuff, but uh, an AWE in Ordinary, uh, it was one of the big ones before my time. It's very classified. My boss, Casper Darling, would know all about it, but he's missing. Can I tell you something? She leans in and she goes, I think he knew that this was coming. Director Trench too. They came up with the HRAs. If we're going to shut this down, you'll need to speak to Trench. He will know what to do. And Jesse's like, uh, he dead, bro. Yeah. Like, weren't were you oh, listening? Yeah, yeah, he's, yeah. he's dead. And Emily smiles and she's like, there's an object of power, a hotline, an old Bakelite telephone. It'll let you contact him. It's in the communications department. So, yeah, so Emily, like, knows the Ordinary was a thing, but she doesn't know what happened. Darling's mm-hmm. missing, Trench missing, but maybe we can speak to Trench on oh, the phone. Oh, no, darling. Interesting. Mm, don't worry, darling. Part two, a fart in the Sahara. What? Yep. So this is where control starts to open up. Uh, the game is structured in a way so that it basically becomes one big fat excuse to tour the oldest house and learn about all the weird stuff in here. You fight the hiss, get powers, unlock parts of the building, read documents, listen to audio files, and do side quests. Excuse me. I've had many an adult juice. <laughs> Jesse's journey into the communications department lets us learn about and see a few in- interesting things. So, for simplicity's sake, I'm going to have to go into teacher mo- mode and just explain some of this stuff as best as I can. Otherwise, again, I'm just going to be reading government documents to, to you for ages. And I'm, I'm going to do that a few times because some of them are really interesting, but I don't want to do this for like two hours. So basically, here's the situation. There are some terms that you need to understand that we learn about in these documents. Number one is para utilitarian. This is somebody who has power natural powers, usually by binding to objects of power. Jesse is a power utilitarian. Director Trench was a power utilitarian. Typically, a director of the FBC kind of has to be a power utilitarian because you have to be able to use a service weapon. 
right? So you were asking earlier, like, can anybody do these? No, only okay. power utilitarians can. Now, what makes a power utilitarian? That's a different question. Uh, the second term you need to know is altered items. That's where we start to get a little bit complicated. So altered items are different from objects of powers, okay? Oops, and altered items, different things. Yeah, I know, I know, they are different things. So an altered item is an ordinary object that has been changed during an altered world event. Power utilitarians cannot bond with altered items or extract any abilities from them, but they can bond with OOPs, oops. All right? Don't stress too much about So they're both kind of created in the same way, but don't... What? Yeah, yeah. So, like, um... So, uh, so like, for example... Do you have any examples? For example, like, yeah. in, 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 an, in an altered world event, mm. um, our microphone here was here already mm. and was possessed and changed by the altered world event, it would become a... Whatever the new thing you have said. So it was something but that was... But the gun seems like something that was created mystically. It's a sort of... A pre, it, it was created by the event. It wasn't possessed and changed. But if we, then if you have things like the floppy disk, mm. that would pre-existed. Mm, that's a good point. So I'm wondering, is it only like the central item specific to the AWE? Is that the only one that becomes an OP and then yeah, just maybe kind some of. tertiary items become? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You kind of hit the nail on the head. So if we cast our mind to Alan Wake, for example, right? Um, uh, remember what I told you about the poltergeist? Uh, the objects would just like launch themselves at Alan, and and because of like the the, the, the glitch, there was a glitch, yeah. yeah, and they turned it into an enemy. Mm -hmm. um, so that was something that was like possessed by the dark presence, right? So 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 you've got those those items, and then you've got like the manuscript pages. The manuscript pages would arguably, be, or the typewriter that created those manuscript pages would be an an object of power. It is an object that had a property that did things but altered items might be like the manuscript pages or um i don't know like if a thermos like a, like a coffee thermos was infected with the dark presence and just like launched itself at alan that would be an altered. so are these going to be hostile items basically arguably yes i mean an object of power could also be hostile but there's yeah. an understanding perhaps that the object of power thinks that it might be sentient yeah. uh potentially uh, potentially and, and that we can interact it and use its power somehow and we can take the power from that yeah, yeah. but you can't take it from something that's just been affected Wait. by something well, yeah. we take the power from it as in it loses the power Yes, it loses that power. Why does the service weapon not lose the power? Uh, because it was created by the board, presumably, and so therefore it's different. Why? Don't know. Can't tell you. Okay. So, yes. Um, again, we're, we're, we're going to get into this, and I guarantee this is going to be the altered item OOP thing is definitely an area where I'm going to get corrected. But I think that's pretty okay. spot on, right? Yeah. So, they are different. That's all you need to know. Something else that Jesse could find in here. <laughs> Something else that Jesse could find in here. Are episodes of a kid's show created by the FBC? <laughs> oh, no. That's horrifying. Yeah. It's called The Threshold Kids. Uncle Mr. Bones. So, can, can either of you just describe yeah, what you're looking anyone, at? For anyone listening along, we're looking at a sort of grainy, uh, old-fashioned TV-looking screen resolution with uh, two horrifying dolls on it. What The one in the background is a sort of malformed clown thing, and the one in the foreground is a skeleton in a suit, like a puppet, a skeleton in a suit with a tiny baby doll's head sort of fused over its own, mm. like halfway into its own skeleton head. So these are in live action. The puppets were made by Remedy and filmed in live action. It's called the Threshold Kits. Who um, did they force to create these? Oh, there's a whole thing in the also, art book about it. That, it's great. Is that is that baby head, Does that is that technically a woman... In the corner of his right eye. Uh, no, I will tell you more about that in a sec. Uh, because I've actually got an episode here that I'm going to tell you about. Oh, so, The Threshold Kids um, is th these horrible handmade puppets shot in live action. They're incredibly creepy. And they were basically created to, quote, teach children in the FBC about paranatural concepts. Children in the This was FBC. a children's show. Yeah. If a child was in the FBC, this was used to teach them about them. Why does... The FBC, as as in people who were just kind of like taken in, or children of employees, or yeah. yeah. I'm so okay. I'm I'm so glad you asked, and I won't be telling you what children this was made for right now. I thought you were meaning like they employ children, no. and the way that you just said that makes me think they do employ children. It's inferred that this or show... slave children. It's inferred that this show was created for one particular child. I will not tell you more. Okay. So right oh. now, right now, um, 
here's an example of an episode, right? So an episode opens with two children. You've got Meg, which is the creepy clown thing that you're talking about. Topher, who isn't in this, but it's like a little boy. So it's a little girl and a little boy. So Meg and Topher, they're being lectured by a skeleton called Mr. Bones, who is wearing a doll's face over his face to try and hide the fact that he's a skeleton. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, to be fair, when you say it like that, that makes it seem a lot less horrifying than it is i will tell you right now that the show is still horrifying because of the way it's it's like every line of dialogue has like a weird like two second beat between it so that every, uh, all the characters like staring to the character the camera for far too long so for example um later. I, i'll show you some i have an example so right now i have an episode for you so here's an episode mr bones is there and he's leading a class almost right and he goes Since little Topher is going on a field trip outside of our beloved bureau today he says I think it's a good time to talk about secrets. A secret is something you don't tell anyone outside the bureau, says Meg. And then, and then Mr. Bones goes, yes, because outside people are... And then Meg and Topher answer in unison, not ready for the truth of reality. <laughs> <laughs> and Mr. Bones is like, very good. If you tell someone a secret, you're hurting their brains very badly. So... Here's a rainbow when he puts up, puts up a picture of a rainbow on a projector. Secret or not secret? Not secret, say the kids. Good. And the true version of a rainbow? Secret. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. What about cats? Not secret. Good. The alpha chimera? Not secret, says Topher. Wrong, barks Mr. Bones. <laughs> <laughs> And it peaks. <laughs> like, it's a proper, like, <laughs> like it comes out, I know it's like a jump scare. Um, pay attention, Topher, or you won't get to go on vacation with your father today. You'll end up like Meg, and you don't want that. Topher looks at Meg. What? What happened to Meg? There's a long, long, oh, long pause. We hear a distant, growling thunder break as Meg looks off into the distance. I'm not allowed to go outside anymore, says Meg. And the episode ends. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Those are amazing. They are absolutely first amazing. All, for the first time in a while, 10 out of 10 and you're acting no notes. Thank no you. notes. <laughs> Love true. that. That's true. Uh, but yeah, so, so there you go. So that's something that she finds. And uh, there's like six of these episodes as well. And they're great. I will be um, watching all of them later. So, yeah, and uh, anyway, so, so her journey takes her further on. Uh, takes her into the dead letters section of the communications department. This was a mail archive dedicated to documenting all of the weird and wonderful letters that the Bureau had received over the years from members of the public. So people are, it's not that people are aware of the FBC, but they might send this off to the government and then the government kind of like transfers it over to them. So, uh, so for example, I have a couple examples for you. Uh, example number one, to whom it may concern. I am being contacted by the past presidents of the United States of America. They appear as spirit guides, giving me their wisdom. John Adams keeps saying I need to fix America, but I can't really understand him. They all have a lot of opinions. People tell me I'm imagining it, but Theodore Roosevelt showed me how to fix my lawnmower, and I don't know a thing about lawnmowers. Explain that, huh? I have a great dead man telling me about the past and the present. If you'd like to use my abilities to help run government, please let me know. I know the White House could use me. (laughs) <laughs> so yeah um, why or, does Bruce not know how to fix your lawnmower I don't know wow. who's to say this is real it could this is why they're dead letters because it's like they're they've not been taken seriously by the FBC mm. but some of these which I'm not going to talk about right now but might should have been probably taken seriously by the FBC I, uh, I, I'll only reference this once because I made a promise to myself that I wouldn't reference it every five mm. minutes but um, there is a, an audio drama podcast called the Magnus Archives mm. that I'm sure some of you will know <sighs> The Magnus Archives is the best thing I've listened to in years, and is it, it control always gives me Magnus Archives vibes. If, yeah. if uh, like quick recap, the Magnus Archives is about uh, the Magnus Institute, which is an institute in London that um, that documents ho- horrific paranormal uh, activities, events, and our lead character, the archivist, sits and records statements that he's reading of people who've sent in and it's a very similar idea and a lot of yeah. and a lot of them early on in the show he's like ah this is clearly a crazy person and yeah. as it goes on you're like well, maybe you should have listened to that one yeah and on, yeah, on uh, re-listens especially you're like 
Uh, no. Yeah, 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 <laughs> Clearly yeah. a cry for help. Uh, yeah. I cannot recommend that show enough. Uh, yeah, it's very good. So anyway, you get the idea, right? Dead letters. We find a bunch of these. Um, there's another one uh, which is very, very short and sweet, which is, Hello, my feet gossip at night, and now I have to wear shoes to bed. Sincerely, me. <laughs> <laughs> so some of these are really good. Um, but yeah. Who did, who did they send that to? Why would you all go like a doctor? Mm-hmm. Some I'm going to send trainer. this to the government. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Um, so, anyway, Jessie passes through. She gets occasional transmissions from the board, guiding her to objects of power she could bomb with, like that floppy disk that I told you about earlier. She finds that down here. Jessie realizes that she might have the title of director, but the board, whatever the hell that is, is clearly in charge here. The pyramid is in the FBC seal, after all. So it's like, it's a key part. The FBC seemed very aware that the board is involved. Whoever the director trench probably took orders from the board, it seems. Yeah. Um, and everyone seemed quite openly aware of that. The hiss is burrowing into our astral plane, the board says when it transmits to her one time. You must stop slash mute them, director. Jessie passes to the comms department and finally sees the hotline. It's sitting in a glass room on a huge column. Underneath it is a long drop, so long that we can't see the bottom. Um, she can't activate the room from where she is, but notices a dangling light switch. Maybe that will activate a bridge or something. She pulls it once, twice, three times. And on the third pull, something very important and interesting happens. She's teleported to a motel. The Ocean View Motel. It's empty. And I really want you to remember that. Ocean View Motel. When you said that made it seem like we should already know that. No, you should not necessarily know the Ocean View Motel. Don't worry about that. It's just this is going to become incredibly important as we keep going. All right? Mm. So Jesse thinks how she stayed in a lot of motels over the years, and somehow this feels like all of them. Every conceivable motel that ever was or ever will be merged into this dream. It's daytime outside, but she can't unlock the door. She's stuck in here. In the motel are some white doors, and on the white doors are some logos. A black inverted pyramid. A white normal pyramid. Four rectangles inside of each other. A spiral. Two circles overlapping. A magnifying glass. Inside a circle, maybe? That was kind of tough, but you kind of get the idea, right? Uh, I'm showing these to you so I don't have to describe them. I'm waiting for a torch. No. Because that, these sigils look very similar to the torch ladies. Could argue that that looks like a hurricane or perhaps the swirling water of a lake. No, 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 that's fine. I just mean the style in which they are drawn looks incredibly similar to the lamp lady's mm. torch sigil. That's a good point. Um, I don't think it is, but I think that's a really good... Uh, this is just a studio that love yeah. creepy symbols. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So, anyway, so she finds these six doors. Important because these doors never change. It's always these six symbols, all right? Right now, I know what two of these doors do. Mm. Oh, great. We do not know what the other four do. There are theories. Uh, but generally, not 100% certain. But these doors never change. They're always the same six symbols. So important. Uh, so to get out of the motel, Jessie needs to participate in ritualistic behavior. She rings a bell three times, like she pulled the light switch three times. Uh, she has to like turn the light switch off and on again. How does she like, find this out? Uh, just for trial and error, we just learn it as a, as a player. We just figure it out. Um, the, the gameplay kind of leads you to understand that. But she has to do ritualistic behavior. I was stuck behavior. in this bit for a little while, I remember the first time. Yeah. Um, it's the sort of compulsive behavior that you hear like people from o- with OCD might have. Um, eventually the door of the Black Pyramid opens, so it's the Black Pyramid door that takes her back into the oldest house. That makes sense. Yeah. So she talks to the light switch and boom, she's back in the oldest house and with a bridge leading to the hotline. A PSA from Darling tells us a little more. Ring, ring, he says. It's Dr. Darling calling. In 1978, a comms department intern he- heard the hotline ring and picked it up, going against every safety protocol in the Bureau. She never recovered, and a handful of witnesses required extensive memory repression therapy. It doesn't connect to any typical network, a direct line to the astral plane and the board, and my hypothesis is, under the right conditions, other planes of existence as well. So we can use the hotline to speak to the board. Um, And the astral plane, if you remember, is the tutorial level. It's just this white place with lots of white obelisks and stuff, platforms, etc. But that's where the the board lives. The board lives in the astral plane, it seems. Mm. At least the pyramid is there. But also the pyramid is in Central Executive. Don't ask me why. But I I assume the pyramid in Central Exec might just be a statue. Could be a statue. Could be, yeah. Could be anything. Um, I think surely not because... small for a... 
But if it, it if it was, why would they care about maintaining that specific room? It's a good point. What I will tell you is I have no idea what that person Well, because there were lots of rooms that were controlled, presumably, lots of important offices. Well, that was central control. <clears throat> like, important scientists work there and stuff. You know, it's like a, it's maybe an important, one of the rooms that just happens to be. But that room is just a lobby. Yeah. Well, maybe you need some, some places to stay stable. I don't know. Like, it's... I think that it's likely some anchor point for the board in the building. Maybe. Maybe. So, yeah, so that's basically just Darling explaining what the hotline is, right? It can speak to other planes of existence, potentially. It could definitely speak to the board. But most importantly of all, it can speak to Director Trench. Why? Is Trench on the board now? Good question. So what happens is whenever... Jesse can't speak to Trench, but Trench can almost, like... We're about to get a bit more of an explanation. So basically, Trench, or a silhouette of Director Trench, speaks to her from the beyond, whatever that is. Um, it's less like he's personally contacting Jesse and more like she's tapping into his memories, like the essence of him, with a glorious monologue. All of these are always monologues. Um, we can do this a few times throughout the game, contacting both Trench and the board, and whenever we do, the contact is a lot like this. So, <clears throat> monologue time. Something's coming, Trench says. The whispers are growing louder. A retribution for my sins. Our sins. A web has been spun, turning this place and its people against me. Something has gotten in. A director needs a team, my management team. People who know the secrets of the Bureau. Darling, Marshall, Marshall especially, my head of operations. She sees right through me. She knows I don't like relying on people. The only person you should fail is yourself. But things change when you become director. I fear for Darling. I haven't heard back from Darling. I fear for Darling. I fear for my friend, my closest ally. I think we made a terrible mistake all those years ago. That thing he studies, it's putting us all in danger. Does he call the hotline or does she just kind of like pick up the phone and, and Trench is like, him. hello? She just sort of tunes into his... She kind of just tunes into it. It's never really that clear, um, because we never... We only see once Jesse pick up the phone and get, like, a transmission from someone. Most of the time, it'll just happen during gameplay, where, like, it'll come and go and, like, oh, a uh, hotline from Trench. And then you go into the menu and, like, watch it. Or you'll get flickers of the transmissions in the oldest house, like, being projected almost on walls as she walks by, and that tells us we've got another one. It's very cool in gameplay, but the, the, always, the insinuation, I think, is always that Jesse almost off screen when we're not controlling her, goes back to central executive where the hotline now is. And I'm, I'm right oh, they move it. Uh, well, I, I, it's, it's very vague. It's very vague. Isn't it a physical object? It is a physical phone, but we never really see Jesse go and go, oh, I need to check the hotline. And then you walk over and you pick it up and do that again. Maybe just, because she's, she's, she's interacted with this object of power, so now just has access to it. That's actually way better than mine. Yeah, I, yeah, and I'm assuming with this cutscene, yeah, this cutscene of Trench as well, from looking at the screenshot in true remedy fashion is, is a like a live action. It's it a, is, it's an yes. actor. Uh, um, he's always smoking. Worth me noting that. And all of these, he's always smoking. God, the that important or is that just flavor? That is technically important. Oh, uh, it, like a chimney. The guy just does not stop. Uh, so yeah, just let you know. Or sorry, he's puffing an adult stick. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yes, always, always oh, going at that. He will not sell your death sticks. Yeah. <laughs> death sticks. So yeah. So so anyway. So that's important. But what he tells us is that. Marshall is his head of operations, and she seems important. She seems to, like, really know Trench. Uh, they had a really good working relationship, it seemed. Um, and that Darling... Best did, friend. Arguably. Um, you could easily argue that. But also, Darling was his close friend and confidant, because Darling was, like, head of research. He was one of the top dogs. It's his SLT. You got Darling, the senior leadership team. You got Darling, you got Marshall. You got a couple of others, but right now they're the two we know about. And Darling did something... Quote, all those years ago, he studied something and has put us all in danger, according to Trench. So we'll learn more about that later. So yeah, Jesse heads off to Pope and she's like, all right, maybe Pope's got some answers about and some clues to what I need to do next. So she goes back to Pope. She's like, Pope, you said he'd help me. Yeah. He didn't help me. So, so yeah, exactly. Yeah. And Pope's like, right, okay, here's the situation. So Pope is super excited to see Jesse the second she walks back in. Oh, the gays, yeah. I love them. Mm. She's just a bundle of energy. She's like, did you get the hotline working? How's the situation in communications? She like slams her folders on the table and runs to Jesse, arms wide, lips parted, ready for the two of them to run away together. Wait, no, that's, 
How did that get in there? Um, <laughs> Jesse is like... Jesse is like, Trench mentions someone called Marshall. Where can I find her? And Pope nods. And she's like, last I saw, Marshall was in the research sector. But we haven't heard from her. She's tough, ex-CIA. But I'm sure she could use your help. However, the way is blocked, yada, 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 game bullshit. Long story short, you need to go into the main maintenance sector first, activate the override, and open up access. Right? Bit of gameplay. So Jess is like, cool, sweet, love it, love this, love you. That's my next step. She gets up to leave, and but Pope stops her. And she's like, before you go, I'd like to run some tests if you don't mind. Somehow you are like immune to the hiss without wearing a HRA, and I want to find out why. And Jess is like, Psh, fine, make it quick. So Pope runs some tests, and then off we go. I feel like that could be much more easily solved by just saying, oh, I've got a magic uh, sparkle thing in my head. No, I'm, I'm just built different. Just built different. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, so we're not going to hang around maintenance for very long at all, uh, but there are a couple of interesting things down here I want to make you aware of. So the first is this guy, Arish. We save him from some hiss and he's like, ma'am, Director Trench, hi, I'm Arish, FBC security, it's a pleasure. And Jess is like, yeah, let's skip the formalities, what's up? And Arish is like, okay, so a few days ago, Dr. Darling told us to guard the power plant, which is down here in the maintenance sector. He stunk of adult juice. Through a few th of these things, he points to the HRA in his but chest. But he seems so lovely. Yeah, but no, he's stinking of adult juice. Was it, the kind of, was it the kind of adult juice that's 40% and made on an island in Scotland? Yes, it is. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 <laughs> so, yeah. I, I was hoping it would be the kind that's like, you know, 1% and tastes like fruit. <laughs> your, your favorite kind. He's just having a, a fun time. Um, Excuse me, this is a uh, four. So yeah, Arish is like, look, Darling came down, he was blurred, he threw some HRA's ass and then he disappeared. I don't know what's going on with him. Um, it seems like he knew what was coming because it all, it's all gone to hell down here like a couple of days after he, he left. Um, the Hiss are destroying the power plant, can you help? Video game bullshit. So Jesse helps, but as she does, she sees the second interesting thing, which is we find the huge NSC power plant that powers the oldest house. NSC stands for... Northmoor Sarcophagus Container. Oh. So named because there's a man called Broderick Northmoor inside of it. Oh. Northmoor was FBC director before Director Trench. We learned about all of this through collectibles. He looks like many people at once. Yeah. He's one guy floating about in there. Um, not dead. Is, sorry, is the inference here that he's powering the place? Well, we learn that he obtained the power natural ability to generate heat. However, as the years passed, his ability grew out of control, endangering everyone in the oldest house. He is still alive, floating around inside the power plant. Just a big heater. Yep, he's just he's powering his beloved bureau to this day. Oh yeah. man. Is he happy about that? I don't know. Would you it be? Look, it looks like he's chained up. No, he chose to go in there. That's what I'll say. He okay. did go in there willingly. That's fine. He still looks like he's chained up. Yeah, he is. If you look at that. And like on his knees. Potentially. Why do you chain him up? I don't know. But he did go in there willingly. I think that's important to note. To to our knowledge, he went in there willingly. Uh, we, we hear that he went in willingly. So, so di director, <laughs> director Radiator's in there. And he's doing his thing. <laughs> yeah, Director Radiator. So yeah, and the third and final thing we found find down in maintenance is our good friend, Atty. And he's chilling in the break room, just waiting for Jesse. You got the job. No, no, yeah. I got a different job. He's like, well done. He says, you got the job, my assistant. And Jesse thinks to herself that She's been a janitor. She's more at home as a janitor's assistant than she ever would be as director. And she's like, Atty, can you help me get to the override? And Atty's like, yes, yes, easy peasy. It's just around the corner. But first, we need to get you working. Very small couple of hours job. And Jesse tries to hold back her frustration at how cryptic he's being. And he's like, ah, you think there's a dog buried in this? I, can... I theory to interject. Yeah, yeah, hit me think that Ati is some form of manifestation of the board. That's a very interesting theory. Mm. That's all I'm going to say. Nothing, nothing more to that. He, there's certainly she is, in fact, the gender's assistant. He's cer well, yeah, he's certainly more to him than meets the eye. It's a very good theory. Uh, I'm going to tell you right now, we don't find out exactly what Ati's deal is, but we do learn a lot more about him as the game goes on. Well, that's fine, because we know there's going to be control too. Yes, uh, I definitely, Ati's going to become a big player, I think, as we keep going. He's definitely something, definitely more going on with this guy than meets the eye. Yeah. He's like, uh, I could tell you were, so yeah, he's like, ah, you think there's a dog buried in this. I could tell you are not yesterday's grouse's son. That's why you'll make a great assistant. You fixed the power plant. That's good. Otherwise, it would blow up and we would all disappear like a fart in the Sahara. 
I've left you clear instructions for what else needs to be done. You'll sort it before I go on my vacation. We hear Jessie think to herself, like, vacation? All right. And Atty, almost as if he heard her thoughts, says, Yes, no one's gonna cancel my holiday, or she's gonna rattle. <laughs> oh, I want a, lot, a lot of weapon imagery here, Atty. Someone does not like their job. No, the guy just wants to go on holiday, all right? I think we've all been there. But if he's the only gender, who's gonna clean the place? Uh, Jesse. Uh, so he goes, anyway, my old enemy, the clog, is blocking the pipes. You need to deal with that shit. He's very clever. <laughs> <laughs> He's very clever. He's trying to sneak in. It's worth knowing that in this room is this picture. It's a postcard of a place called Watery in the state of Washington. We will come back to this another time. This man with his towel and adult juice has a horrifying <gasps> smile. Yeah, a really creepy looking smile. If you want to be really clever about it right now, uh, what other game takes place in the state of Washington? Uh, uh, Alan Wake. Uh, 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 uh. So yeah, so he's like, right, my old enemy, the clog, you know, go get rid of the clog. But also, coming back, um, that leads me more to a point that I was going to say, but I didn't. <gasps> the lake, it's becoming an ocean. It's interesting thought process, yeah. Yeah, that's oh. all. Mm. We'll talk about this later. This is important. I've been very odd about this whole lake ocean metaphor today. I don't know why. I mean, it's, a good, li- it's a good line. Mm. It's a good line, and it keeps coming back. Um, you know, we've got the Ocean View Motel. It's important to know that Ati um, is the uh, name for the Finnish god uh, deity, a Finnish deity of, like, fishing. Oh. Um, so, like, I think it's fishing. Do correct me if I'm wrong, guys. I think but Sam I'm Lake sure just that. really likes the fact that his name is Lake. And wanted to make a lot of water puns. Yeah, I believe it. Um, but the really key thing here is I just want you to remember the name Watery, and that's where Atti's going on his vacation. Okay. All right? America's Little Finland. It's very cute. So, yeah. Uh, anyway, so Jessie takes care of a couple of tasks in maintenance. She clears out the hiss. Uh, she destroys piles of literal shit uh, oh, that are oh. yeah, clogging up the pumps. This is the clog. Okay, uh, I didn't get very far into this game because I don't remember this. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, maintenance is arguably the worst bit of the game. I'm glad you didn't get much further than me. No, oh, me too. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and eventually she uh, she hits the override and makes it out of maintenance. Good stuff, as we do. Trench calls us from the hotline and explains that he set up the lockdown. So that's important. He's the one that shut down the entire facility. Uh, so Jesse checks back in with Pope and uh, decides that it's time to come clean about like Polaris and everything. So she's like, I have been completely honest. I have a younger brother, Dylan Faden. When we were kids, we found an old slide projector in Ordinary's landfill. The slides created like doorways to other places. Bad things happened, came through. But we found help. Through one of the doorways, we met something, a being. A being? Pope asks. What kind of being? It's hard to describe, Jesse says, but it... She helped us. And at the word she, uh, we see Polaris, like, fade in over the screen as if she likes that. So we're going to call Polaris she from now on. Uh, this is kind of what happens. You'll see, like, the, the sides almost wrinkle and shimmer. So, mm. uh, just a theory. If Jesse suspects that Dylan is in, you know, in custody of the FBC almost, yep. very likely that those, those <clears throat> children, that children's show was made for him. Potentially. It's a fair theory. Okay. Jesse's like, we managed to turn the projector off. The bad things that came through the doorways were gone. After that, your people came, tried to grab us. I got away, but... And a look of guilt like flashes across her face and she goes, they got Dylan. This is news to Pope. She looks concerned, not the excitement that we're used to. What happened to the slide projector, Pope asks. It sounds like another object of power. And Jesse's like, well, I thought you guys took it. And Pope shakes her head. She's like, if we did, I wouldn't know about it. Around here, assume everything is classified. I'm not, like, high level. I'm low level. I was, like, Darling's assistant, but I didn't get told everything. So after you mentioned Ordinary, Pope says, I did some digging into the AWE recorded against it. Trench and Darling were both involved. A large area of the containment sector was reserved for it, but I don't know what's down there. I've never been in the containment sector. So she pulls out some files, and she's like, So I've been looking into your test results, by the way. Your readings are incredible, Jesse. Cross-referencing them with the database, I found two matches in Darling's old classified files. Unfortunately, I can't access them beyond the file codes, but one was codenamed P6, referring to a prime candidate for a future bureau director. Jesse immediately assumes that she's talking about Dylan. The other match is on something called Hedron, which must be connected to these HRAs. They're called Hedron Resonance Amplifiers. But I can't figure out any more, and I can't find any more information. It's all locked away. 
So Jesse notes that she can't go after Dylan until she's gotten to Marshall, the head of operations. She might have more information. So off we go. But first, we cut to black. And out of the black steps Atty, looking at the camera. We take turns to come for a visit. We hear his voice, but his lips don't move. I helped you. You owe me now. And when time comes, I will come calling. Mm. Anyway, uh, on to part three. Fetch quests are boring, so extra lore time. <laughs> so with the override lifted, Jesse heads off to the research sector. It's numerous floors piled on top of one another with a central staircase. Despite the fact there are no windows in the oldest house, it seems like plant life is somehow able to grow in the research sector. Hmm, odd. Posters adorn the walls. FBC propaganda saying things like, no modern technology. Jesse stumbles across Casper Darling's office, and in it are obsessive drawings of a hexagonal symbol and another PSA this time talking about the astral plane where the board contacts us from. An early hypothesis was that the mindscape of the astral plane is subjective, Darling says, but that was fast proven wrong. It's an actual place, not a construct of the mind, even though that is how one enters it through their mind. By monitoring the brainwaves of those who have entered, we've been able to learn more about what it looks like, what's there. We see a black inverted pyramid. We have glimpsed movement, a native species, but always in the distance. Curiouser and curiouser. It's in the luck and probability department that Jesse finds Helen Marshall. She has assembled a war table with a rough map of the oldest house. She's armed to the gills with machine guns, heavily armed soldiers. She's old, it seems, and not hugely happy to see Jesse. Congratulations to your appointment, Director Faden. Zachariah is dead then, and I see you've found his gun. Just call me Jesse, Jesse says. Listen, Marshall cuts her off. Darling had a machine that could mass-produce HRAs. We need them if we're going to fight back the hiss, but we need black rock prisms to make the machine work, and the only place we can get them is the black rock processing site in the basement of the building. Jess is like, oh, fetch quest, okay, fine. Look, fine, I'll get your damn rock, but first, I need you to tell me what you know about Dylan Faden. And Marshall sighs and is like, I knew this was coming. Listen, lives are at stake here. We need this machine working. Once that is done, Director Faden, then we can talk. Jesse's like, fine, but again, don't call me director. Jesse is fine. I'll call you Faden, Marshall says. <laughs> Just a bit of a dick, you know. Yeah. Uh, but, but that's a yeah. compromise. So Jesse heads off to Black Rock Processing. It is a long journey. So while she does, I want to tell you about a couple of the other random things that we find in here, because that's way more interesting, yeah. right? So the first is, um, it's this memo. Technological restrictions. Quote, the oldest house does not allow modern devices that receive or emit any redacted signal. R radio, which... Oh, we signal. love redacted dog. Oh, it's making everywhere. me feel very SCP. Very SCP. This, by the way, is pretty much what all of the collectibles in the game look like. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, so... The oldest house does not allow modern devices that receive or emit any redacted signal. Radio waves are the only transmittable signals in the oldest house, and even those are unreliable. So no Wi-Fi, basically. Mm. Uh, modern technology tends to disappear and break here, sometimes quite violently. Redacted agents have been injured by cell phones exploding in their pockets while entering the oldest house. All of the technology is old in the oldest house. You've got old tape recorders, old slide reels, old TVs, hell, even the computers appear to be old, so just worth acknowledging. The second is this memo, entitled Television Show Proposal. We would like to propose the creation of a television series that presents superstition and skeptical thought as entertainment. In order to popularize these concepts among the civilian population and create less resistance to redirecting information regarding public paranatural events. We can also use a solid media outlet to test paranatural concepts on civilian audiences, seeing how they react to certain facts when they're presented as fiction in the event that the Bureau ever decides to make certain realities public knowledge, like your Alpha Chimera or the true nature of a rainbow. There are various show licenses that we could purchase and reboot rather than starting from scratch. One particular property seems promising, especially considering its content and tone are precisely what we're looking for. It's called... What's it called, guys? Light Springs. Springs. And it's been off the air for a few years now. So the FBC were the ones writing the shows for Night Springs nowadays. They, to to use it to like send, sell, uh, not sell, but like... To, to, to sort of inoculate the public a little bit to oh. sort of start getting these ideas in their head. Yeah. Now, as I remember from Alan Wake, wasn't 
Night Springs during the course of Alan Wake explaining things in Alan Wake? Not necessarily, no. It kind of was. Um, they, they were they were kind of cutesy. The Night Springs also, episodes we also, found were Twilight Zone episodes, the FBC, basically. The FBC weren't writing Night Springs at that point. That's what I'm wondering is is because because it says because it, it says one of the one of the properties that we're considering purchasing and rebooting is called Night Springs. So that it, it might not be that they were writing it at that point. It's important to note that um, Night Springs episodes we find in Alan Wake are all in black and white, if that helps, perhaps. Mm. But really, we can't tell. I My belief oh, is that... Yes. But the one we found in Quantum Break was not. It was not. You're absolutely right. It wasn't. It was colour. But bear in mind, that was also... It was just a behind-the-scenes clip of people pretending to be the narrator, auditioning for the narrator. I don't care. That's still made by the Bureau. Yeah, yeah. Fair, fair, yeah potentially. Um... Of all the things, I don't think you would become Quantum Break's biggest advocate, Chase. Well, I'm no, I'm, I'm not Quantum Break's biggest advocate. I'm the biggest advocate of Quantum Break being part of the wider Remedy verse. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. It technically is, but also not. And you'll find out why before we finish Control today. So, yes. So Night Springs, owned by the FBC. Mm-hmm. In order to get to Blackrock Processing, Jesse needs to go back through the Ocean View Motel. That light switch that transports her there just seems to like appear whenever she needs a quick route to her next destination, uh, almost like it's waiting for her. So it's her fast travel? It's not fast travel. I mean, arguably, you could argue it is, but it's never kind of described that way or, or it becomes like a mechanic that way. Mm. There is fast travel in the game, but at no point is it linked to the Ocean View. Wow, okay. Something in the building here is is ready and willing to take her back places when she needs it. Yeah, 100%. Um, so yeah, she passes through the Ocean View Motel a few times over the course of the game. I'm not going to describe every time she does. But every time she goes same. through the Black Door, the Black Pyramid. Door. Every time she goes through the Black Pyramid. Okay. Yes, that's important. And so because she's going to pass through the Ocean View again, here's some interesting stuff we find out about the motel. So the first is another PSA by best boy, Casper Darling. Look at him, he's so great. Oh, darling. Yeah. So during an AWE investigation, Darling says, our agents discovered a light switch cord in a Montana bungalow closet. They pulled the cord and were immediately transported to the Ocean View Motel and Casino. He pulls a prop cord next to him and the lights go out. Pulling out a torch, he lights the bottom of his face and is like... He's so theatrical, I love it. so dramatic. (laughs) He's like, dream like his, And then it like cuts halfway through the ooh to the next shot. It's very good. Um, But yeah, inside, he says, they found a door marked with an inverted black pyramid. And just like that, it led back to the oldest house, 2,000 miles from Montana. Now, we're finding the cord in increasing numbers throughout the Bureau. Somehow, the two places, they became attuned to each other. The actual physical location of the ocean view is a mystery. Stepping beyond its walls has proven impossible. It's a place of power, like the oldest house. Want to hear what Director Trench has to say about it? Mm -hmm. Sure. So, Director Trench says, The ocean view motel is a familiar friend to me. It operates on dream logic and can act as a convenient lock to keep out those not trained in dreamscape navigation. Even Bureau veterans can only find one key in the motel, the key that opens the door marked with the inverted black pyramid. The rest, the many other doors, are still mysteries to us. We're all merely guests there, even the board. Sometimes I need to visit, just to breathe easier for a while. It beats the numb, sterile apartment I spend my nights in, insulated from everything but myself. I guess that's where the adult juice comes in. So once again, Jesse walks through the door with the black inverted pyramid on it and comes out into maintenance, bumping into Arish. The head of security was like, oh, ma'am, Director Trench, hello. Um, he was, you know, sauced when he, Darling was sauced when he came to see us. And Jesse's like, I need to get to Blackrock Processing. Apparently I can get to it through maintenance. What, what way do I go? And Arish is like, well, I've got good news and bad news for you. Good news is it's right down that hole. The bad news is there's a monster blocking your way. <laughs> <laughs> Classic. Swings and roundabouts. <laughs> so Jesse's like, a monster? Yeah, all right. I've shot plenty of hits by now, Arish. Who cares? I'll kill it. And Arish is like, wait, no, seriously. It's bad news, but Jesse's already off. Uh, and then we meet the monster. And I have concept art because you don't see it very well in the game. But this is... Uh, this is the monster that we have to face. It's quite horrible. Mm. It is. It's arguably the most inhuman monster that we will fight. So this is a new enemy type called the Hiss Distorted. I've not really shown you much of the Hiss in action, and that's because they operate very similarly to the Taken in Alan Wake, so it doesn't really merit going into right now, except that they can shoot. 
basically. Uh, but with a couple of vital differences. Where the Taken were just possessed and cloaked in shadow, the Hiss are physically transformed as well. Whatever the Hiss is, it's monstrous in what it does to people. With the Distorted, for example, the flesh on their torso and thighs have peeled outwards. Their ribcage is bent out and exposed. The wings, you see, are flaps of flesh from their back that have been stretched, overtaken by the Hiss residents so they look like they've been split and feathered. So, Jesse defeats this monster, and it will pop up a few more times. Uh, and eventually makes it to da -da -da -da, the Black Rock Quarry. Underground, in a basement of the oldest house. With stars. Is this humongous canyon. It's Elden Ring. Yeah, it is. It's very Elden Ring. It stretches off for miles. A night sky can be seen with stars and constellations. No smoking signs are up, because even though all of this feels like it's outside, the quarry is in fact inside the oldest house, and some of the staff members have come down here for a quick... <laughs> yeah, a quick, quick smoke whenever they need to. So yeah. Um, black, sleek obelisks of rock jut out. Similar to the black rock that you might have seen acting as platforms in the astral plane, back when Jessie was undergoing her tutorial. So Polaris, when we get here, Polaris starts to vibrate. Jessie can feel her squirming in the presence of the rock. The rocks, the prisms, the HRAs, Jessie thinks, they mean something to you, don't they? We find another PSA from Darling. Extra dimensional matter, he says, holding up a piece of the rock. It has the unique property of blocking out a lot of frequencies. A good thing, it keeps things stable, contained. Think of it as paranatural lead. Uh, so I'll bring you back to the fact that the bunkers, the one that Pope and her team came out of, was made of that weird black rock. It's made of this stuff, this stuff they mined mm. from the basement of the oldest house. So yeah, just interesting and bizarre. And again, this massive quarry with stars and constellations are here. Um, so yeah, so Jessie gets some of the rock, heads back to Central Executive. But while she does, I want to show you something silly and fun. So, uh, silly and fun? Silly and fun. Uh, this is a room, an office rather, covered in yellow post-it notes. <laughs> yep. Inside this room, we find a memo. The memo reads, to whom it may I, think, I think you found many memos here. <laughs> yeah. um, to whom it may concern, the memo says, in case you are not aware, something caused a sticky note to my office to duplicate. My office is unusable now. <laughs> I, will, <laughs> I, I will be working from home until this is resolved. You can reach me on my cell. Sincerely, Jay Bozer. Unfortunately, Bozer was in charge of maintaining the mail tubes positioned throughout the oldest house, and while he was away, a couple of them became altered items, leading to this memo from a frustrated colleague, which reads, Hey Bozer, get this, the accounting department still says they haven't received my expense reports. They say the receipts probably got lost in the mail tubes because of a shift or a threshold or some such fuckery, and that if I don't have the origins, they can't verify my expenses for reimbursement. Why do we even use these tubes if they just spit our mail out to some other goddamn dimension? <laughs> so Bozer took the day off because a post note took over his office and it absolutely like wrecked communications amongst the oldest house. Anyway, so Jesse finds Marshall in Central Executive. She... Irish and Pope are all working from here now. It's turning into like our base of operations. We collect staff members like Pokemon, so that's all good. Uh, she gives it to Marsh. So she gives Marshall the Black Rock. And Marshall's like, thank you for this. We'll start HRA production immediately. I promised you some information, so here it is. Your brother is here. He was once a prime candidate called P6, exactly what Jesse thought. He was groomed to be the future director after Trench. He had talent far beyond any other candidate in the program. So you kidnapped him, Jesse says. We took him in, Marshall replies firmly. Your parents vanished along with every other adult in ordinary. Eventually, his power changed him. There were casualties. He wasn't fit for the prime candidate program. He's in the containment sector in the Panopticon. Jesse gets a burst of guilt for running away all of those years ago. I'm going, she says. I expected as much, Marshall replies. I need to go and check on something. Something I can't let the hiss find. It shouldn't take long but you must watch the Bureau while I'm gone. Remember, Dylan is dangerous. Do not let him out of containment, Director Faden. Mm. So Marshall's off to do something mysterious. God knows where she's gone. Uh, we will find that out another day. Part four I've just called the Panopticon. Jesse heads off to the containment sector in the Panopticon. What is the Panopticon, I hear you ask? Well, don't worry, we've got Director Trench on the phone to tell us. So, and he's like, oh... How very convenient of him. Oh, he always pops up whenever you need him. Um, so he's like, the Panopticon is home to the altered items we find and contain. It is a maximum security prison. It is a vault for the most valuable treasures on Earth. It is a powder keg big enough to blow this sure. world to dust. Your brother's an altered item. Uh -huh. uh, well, Marshall said that he was in the prime candidate program. He's in the containment sector in the Panopticon. Also, love, they have a whole prime candidate program. Jesse comes in, 
screw your program. It's me, bitch. Yeah. It's me. Uh, yeah. yeah. So yeah. everything, everything dangerous or valuable is in here including people <laughs> including people pretty much yeah. to describe it literally in trench's words it's it's a vault it's a prison it's a powder keg it's a temple filled with idols and angry gods it's all of these and none of them it's something more profound unbelievable unknowable something worse we found many altered items I, I feel like it's pretty noble it's a room they appeared mundane, he says, but that couldn't be further from the truth. They press heavy in our minds because that's their nature. They've been altered because we can't stop thinking about them. We put them on altars because they're used used to being worshipped. So these items, they, they almost have like a personality set in a sense. This keeps them calm. We contain them, but they don't want to be controlled. We study them to discover what makes them tick. If this place were ever breached, it would be chaos of biblical proportions. But before she makes it to the Panopticon, Jesse Are finds, they trying to imply that, they, that the Christian God is an altered object? No, I think it just means like, you know, biblical proportions is huge, it's humongous. You know, it's just a turn of phrase. I don't know. They said gods are in here. Yeah. Oh, I, I, and they said it's biblical. I think that some gods might be in here. Um, so yeah. I'm, I'm in there. I would happily put you in the Panopticon, Jess. <laughs> <laughs> hey, oh my God. So... Before she makes it to the Panopticon, Jesse finds this guy, Horowitz. He's bleeding heavily. He's having a bad time, Horowitz. Uh, he's bleeding heavily, injured from a fight with the Hiss. Don't look at me like that. I'm fine, he says. But my squad mate, Wells, you gotta help him. We were hunting a runaway altered item. We followed it down into the clocks. Jesse is like, what are the clocks? And Horowitz is like, yeah, the clocks. It's a threshold. The Bureau sealed it up years back because of all the clocks. So that's what we call it now. You've got to get Wells out of there, please. Jesse sets off. It's a side mission, but it's kind of interesting, so I'm, I'm flagging it to you because people would get mad if I didn't, to be honest. Um, as she moves down, she finds piles of clocks. Again, it's oh, not I've a seen this one. yeah, it's not a great clip, but you do see them. Just clocks and clocks everywhere, uh, ticking clocks. Like what is duplicated over and over and over again. They spill over each other into corners, threatening to swallow the space up. Battling through them, Jesse finds. Wells, he's okay. And thankfully, he explains a bit about what the hell is going on with the clocks. So he's like, it's a threshold effect. This used to be a regular office wing before the threshold manifested. So thresholds, remember, are like parts of the oldest house that switch and change. Mm -hmm. And then they get named a threshold after they change. So yeah, uh, the forces at play in there got a hold of someone's old clock and started duplicating it. Now the office is abandoned and it's clocks all the way. He goes on to note that the clocks... Clocks all, all the way, way baby. <laughs> So he goes on to note that the clocks have never duplicated as fast as this, though. They've sped up dramatically. Jesse asks, Horowitz said you came down for an altered item? What is it? The anchor, Wells says. Yeah, this was supposed to be a simple item retrieval, but the power that thing had, I've never seen anything like it. So, what is the anchor? Well, luckily, we find some we've got some lore dumps for our lore dumps. So, uh, there's a memo called Ocelot's Anchor. Which reads, a Trotman-style anchor made of iron with a wooden stock. Surface is rusted in places. The item generates a persistent blank sphere, the purpose of which is currently unknown. The crew of the White Ocelot first encountered a strange spherical phenomenon while fishing. Witnesses described it as a black sphere with faint light behind it. It hovered just off the bow of the ship. The crew redacted by throwing a tin bucket which disappeared into the sphere. Soon after, the vessel lost structural integrity. The ship's metal rusted and fell apart within minutes. As the ship sank, the sphere lowered into the water. A passing fishing vessel called Redacted rescued the four surviving crew. Yes, the SS Redacted. On the 25th of April 1983, Name Redacted, a ranger first class, was dropped into the sphere wearing a diving suit with a dedicated oxygen line. After 10 minutes and 13 seconds inside the sphere, the oxygen line was cut at the sphere's border by an unseen force. All agents in the room experienced vomiting, vertigo, and loss of fingernails within an hour of one another. The ranger has been declared missing in action, presumed dead. So we don't get it confirmed. But the reading of this is that the anchor, like, it's, it almost, like, speeds you up. It, it, you know, it fast-forwards time, in a sense. So there was something in here that was making the clocks duplicate slowly, but the anchor's presence has sped up that duplication process. It's two altered items almost interacting with one another. Okay. That's why people started to, like, move very quickly and, and you know, their fingernails fell out. They just all aged incredibly. Messing with those chrono particles. Maybe it's just covered in chronon particles. I wonder... Yeah. Natural time machines. Did you just find an anchor in a cave? Uh, we're referencing quantum break, people. That's quantum <laughs> break. 
Anyway, Jesse eventually finds the anchor, so it's all good. Uh, it's whizzing around an open chamber, spawning more clocks and firing them at her. Uh, it's covered in the sphere. It's a boss fight. Oh, it's cool. It also knows how to use launch. Finishing up with the anchor, uh, Jesse and Wells make it out of the threshold, planning to make it back to Horowitz. But they're too late. The hiss got to him. He's babbling incoherently, the same monologue as all of the others. You know, you are a worm through time, the egg, the egg etc. So, yeah, all good stuff. Um, he's dead. It's sad. Horowitz's HRA must have been damaged in the threshold, Wells says. God damn it. Jesse helps him put his old friend down. We have to kill Horowitz because he's been taken. The anchor raises a couple of red flags, though. I thought the Panopticon was supposed to be some maximum security prison. So how the hell did the anchor get out? Well, we've got someone new to meet who might have a couple of answers. Frederick Langston, the Panopticon's supervisor. And he's like, uh, hi, can I help you? When Jesse arrives. And Jesse's like, sup, I'm Jesse, new director. And this is news to Langston. I was about to say, he's the only one so far who hasn't just known. Yeah. That yep. there's a, like everybody else is like psychically known there's a new director. Well, like, not psychically so much as for thing me it was pictures on the wall that has changed to Jesse, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Pope spotted like a portrait on the wall which was previously trenched, now has Jesse in it. So some side the oldest house has shifted to let everyone know there's been a change. Got it, got it, got it. Uh, he just has been unaware of this, presumably because he's in the Panopticon, which is. Locked down, maximum security, maybe just the changes don't happen here. So he's like, uh, can I help you? What's going on? And she's like, I'm the new director. Um, and he's like, uh, okay, well, nice to meet you. It's not the best time for a tour. We've got hiss everywhere. Numerous system failures across the board, cell breaches, but you're the director, so here we go. And he gives him like a big, long sigh, and then he jumps into his spiel. And he's like, founded by Zachariah Trench, the Panopticon is our state-of-the-art facility for... Jesse cuts him off. I don't have time for this. Faden, Dylan Faden, where is Dylan Faden? And Lance is like, oh, P6? Okay. Uh, Darling asked for him to be kept away from people. He's in the maximum security cells. Or oh, if he's specifically, then the cartoon's definitely for him. Mm. Um, yeah, again, it's inferred. It's not. It's not confirmed. So I think, yeah, I, I believe. I agree with you both. I think Threshold Kids was made for Dylan. Jesse's like, open the damn door, Lanks, and I'm going in. I want to get my brother. And Lanks is like, well, if you say so. I usually tell first timers not touch anything. So uh, you know, just do that. Oh, and please, ma'am, call me Fred. Thank you, Langston. Jesse replies. <laughs> She's doing a marshal. I was supposed to say. Yeah. Can we all just freaking respect what people want to be called? Yeah, I know. It's not. It's not tough. Um, so. Thank you, Langston, Jesse replies. So as she journeys into the Panopticon, Langston fills us in a little more on altered items. He explains that they keep them under control with rituals, superstitious activity, flicking the lights three times, singing to them. Jesse's like, did he just say singing? What? But the hiss has breached the cells of some of them. It's changed them, made them aggressive. They're not dangerous by nature. Some of them just like a bit of attention, but the hiss has done something to them and some of them have gotten loose. If you think of them like storms, they rain weird stuff, but it's usually harmless. But now the hiss is making them rain like knives. Knife rain. <laughs> <laughs> knife rain. Knife rain. Uh, I loved yeah. Knife Rain's second album. Jesse is like, Langston, do you like working at the FBC? You seem a little, like, bored. <laughs> and Langston's like, yeah, it's all right. The driver can be a little much, but I get much better benefits here than I would have at the Postal Service. Been here 15 years. I started as a junior agent because my uncle knew a guy. I put in a steady eight hours a day, go home, feed my cat. It's good. Also, do you smoke? Trent used to stand here all day and smoke like a chimney, but now he's gone. Maybe I can get some scented candles or something to clear it out. So Jess is like, no, I don't. Whatever. You're, you're, you're a lot. It, even though you're so bored, you just don't stop talking. Um, so she keeps heading on to the She Pope. likes that from Pope, not from Langston. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pope could talk for a million years and she wouldn't get bored of her. Like, she's a bit dumb with Langston. He's a bit, yeah. yeah. The, the guy's a bit of a, like, he's a desk jockey. Like, he's in charge of the Panopticon, but he's just here to, like, get his pay and feed his cat, which is fine. But, you know, you are dealing with supernatural stuff, Langston. Maybe get a bit of pep in your step. <laughs> Jesse keeps heading on to the Panopticon and there's some fun altered items here that I want to show you. So let's count them down. We've got yeah. a rubber duck. Ooh. The rubber duck is one of the altered items that escaped the Panopticon. Jesse goes to retrieve it, and then wham, like a shot, it zaps to the other side of the room. So here's a memo on it, on the rubber duck. The item makes a sound like quacking. It travels considerable distances with surprising speed. How it achieves this motion is unknown. The item forms a redacted of unknown purpose with anyone who makes direct physical contact with it. I think it's meant to be like a bond, perhaps? Um, and begins to follow them, quacking often. This has led to a researcher entering cardiac arrest, though due to the individual's health issues, 
issues the matter may not have been considered like connected to the item uh, it was discovered in the home of Agent Redacted after his young daughter complained of being followed by her rubber duck. According to Agent Redacted, the matter was ignored, believed to be the result of a child's imagination, until he began to hear the quacking at night. After discovering the item hiding in his daughter's closet, he brought it to the Bureau for study. Update. It was discovered that Agent Redacted was bringing known paranatural materials into his home, illegally taking them outside the oldest house. How this may have affected the creation of an altered item is being investigated. Agent Redacted has been terminated. Fair play. Yeah. This one is going to be important when we talk about the DLC. In a sense, in a sense. Um, so we have a Christmas tree contained in a soundproof cell. It was taken from a Canadian research station in Antarctica where it was used to celebrate the holiday season. In 1979, solar radiation damaged the radio, severing the base's only means of communication with the outside world. After the frozen passages opened, a military expedition visited the base to re-establish contact. They found the base's occupants in various states of madness, rambling about voices in the tree. Military personnel discovered they also heard the tree speaking. After locking the item in a supply crate, they brought it back to the mainland, at which point the Bureau intervened. Through the research of, and this is important, Dr. Theodore Ash, the Bureau has learned that the tree mimics the speech it hears from an unknown radius. However, its vocabulary is incomplete. By cross-referencing the missing words, he learned that repeating them in various ways can elicit a reaction from other altered items. Oh... They tested the specific string of words, a formula, if you will, on the other altered items kept in the examination hall. Varying physical responses were recorded with each one with an 82% success rate. This proves that words can tangibly affect these altered items. So this, whatever it was, seemed to have a string of phrases and words that a Dr. Theodore Ash was able to almost like combine into some form of formula. When, when read to, like an incantation, when read to an other altered item, it had like a reaction of some capacity. Okay. Um, different types of reactions. We don't learn much more about what those reactions are, but it's just interesting. You can almost like create an incantation to interact with, a, with an altered item. Which I feel like we'll do in the DLC. Then there's some memos about a pair of cowboy boots. Oh, hell yeah. Uh, this was actually kind of neat. Uh, so, within the US Embassy in Havana on September 23rd, 2017, the embassy staff were subjected to the influence of what would be identified as an altered item, a single cowboy boot, resulting in the injury of a majority of the staff and including multiple fatalities. The entirety of the staff was returned to the States and evaluated by FBC medical staff, who would identify intense cellular damage reminiscent of radiation exposure. After the FBC became involved in the event, the communications department was able to spread the narrative that foreign powers had launched an attack on the embassy, conveniently explaining the evacuation of the facility and the injuries sustained. So this is actually a real world phenomenon, this one. Um, it's called Havana Syndrome. I don't know if either of you guys have heard of this. No? So Control kind of took this concept uh, and they've brought it into its universe. So in 2021, I've just got a bit of information about this because it's kind of cool. In 2021, BuzzFeed published a declassified US State Department report. BuzzFeed, I know, but interesting. That analyzed audio recordings of the Havana Syndrome. The report concluded with high confidence that the most plausible culprit was noise produced by the Indies' short-tailed cricket. So there was like a cricket game over the ridge and somehow this like consistent sound to people A crazy. cricket game. A cricket game. I thought you meant a, a, I, I thought you meant a cricket, the insect. No. Indies short tailed cricket. That is oh, an no, sorry, that, that is an insect. Yeah. So it's not a cricket game, you're absolutely right, sorry. Yeah, the insect, a cricket. So that you the can cut, you can cut that bit out. Just a twenty four seven game of cricket. <laughs> so yeah, and it basically it drove people insane, apparently. Um so yeah, combined with mass hysteria brought on by a high stress work environment. Uh, and yeah, so the State Department claimed it was just because of this cricket. According to control, it's the cowboy boots. They made some weird sound and it drove made people mad. Okay, cool. So yeah, uh, there are a bunch of others, but before we get back to the story, I just want to show you one more. And this is the really important one. This one's like absolutely important. It's an Arctic Queen fridge. Jesse comes across there sitting calmly inside its cell. An FBC staff member called Philip is sitting, staring at it, and begs Jesse to help him. Someone has to watch this fridge at all times or it deviates, he says. I've been staring at it since yesterday with no breaks. Please, I'm not even allowed to blink. Get me out of here. God. Yeah, and Jesse is like, don't worry, and heads round. But just as she's about to open the door to the cell, she hears Philip's voice. Oh God, I blinked. I, oh no, hello, the fridge is doing something. 
We hear a raw, ethereal roar, and when Jesse opens the door, Philip is gone. Jessie tries to get it under control, calm it down with her powers, but then suddenly everything goes dark. She's transported to a black void, like the astral plane, but reversed. We hear a sound, something in the void looming out of the darkness, something speaking, trying to communicate. It sounds like the board, Jessie thinks, but I can't understand it, and it does, it sounds like when it's ever speaking. And then, finally, we see it, whatever is here. The health bar tells us that this is called the former, and you can't really make it out with the image, but it's got a spotlight for an eye, and it's got huge, massive arms, mm. and two tiny tentacles, and it's almost like a huge snake, but with huge legs. So yeah, so this is a boss fight. We have a football fight with this thing. Jesse fights it, defeats it, and it escapes back into the void. Jesse's then transported back into the Panopticon, and then, for a moment, there's Cam. Jesse looks at the fridge. She doesn't feel any resonance from it anymore. Huh, she says. It seems that scaring that thing off fixed the fridge. Oh well, off to the next thing. So suddenly the hotline then rings, and it's the board. Just not going to care about, you know, the guy who's dead. Uh, he's dead. Uh, she killed the former, or she, she didn't kill it, sorry. She just beat it back, mm. and it's like escaped out of the fridge and off somewhere else. Not in our plane of reality, but in the astral plane. Okay. Oh, or whatever this Which is why the board's suddenly calling. It's going, what did you send us? Yeah. Pretty much. So the hotline Jesse, rings. you'll never guess what, my dog just came back home. The hotline rings and it's the board, and they have to speak to us, it's urgent, they say. The former slash dissent is not gone, they say. It is previous slash disappointment, and is not part of the board. We apologise for the inconvenience. It is stealing slash linking altered items. It builds a competition slash not us. You must destroy if possible. Do not believe slash get hyped about the former's lies slash adverts. Oh, this doesn't work nearly as much when I can't see it written out. It doesn't. I know it might be a little bit frustrating. I just, I can't, yeah, I, I can't know, pick no, one yeah, because no, then no, it's, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah. We provide slash offer better bonus package or health plan. <laughs> If you leave, you will be sorry slash dead, and you will never work slash exist in this torn cosmic reality again. So it's basically like All this right, thing board, is like, down. yeah. Clearly it's like an anti-board, it seems. Um, whatever it is, but it's, it's called the former. So uh, It used to be on the board, was what I got from what they were yeah, saying. They described it as a disappointment, so. Yeah. We, it is worth me knowing that we do fight this thing again in this game, uh, not in the DLC, in the original game. Okay. Um, it takes over a plastic flamingo that can control the weather. Uh, Jessie jumps into the black void again, kicks its ass, and after it escapes a second time, she thinks to herself that it seems to hate the board for some reason. So, and right now that's all you really need to know about that, but we'll come yeah. back to that another time. Anyway, all right, back to the story. So, Jessie <laughs> heads up to the Panopticon into maximum security, hunting for Dylan. She finds his cell, but when she arrives, he's gone. Oh, what a surprise. The cell is a mess. It seems to have exploded from within. The name Jessie is scratched into what remains of the glass. Oh, Christ. Me thinks it's not a coincidence that she happened to arrive at the Bureau when she did. Yep. Suddenly, Emily Pope crackles up on the comms. Emily, thank God, Jesse says. I found where they were keeping Dylan, but he's gone. I know, Pope says. That's because he's here with us. He just walked into Central Executive. He, Jesse, listen, he says he's giving himself up. He's been affected by the hiss, but he's different from the others. And we cut to black. He is wrecked, mm. this prison. And also, why does this prison kind of look like it is, like down to like the lighting rig? Mm. The stage for a rock concert? Well, I've got two ideas about this. So the room, so the room is, okay. the, so the, the whole room isn't the prison. It's that box in the middle that's been burst out of, mm. right? You can see what looks like obsidian stuff on top. The red lighting is what you're referring to is shining on it. And we saw red lighting flood the facility earlier. Yeah. So yes. the red lighting is significant in affecting something relating to the, the okay. powers. Cool. So that it's just the box in the middle of the room, I think, that is the prison. This thing is there, like a glass pane here that I'm just not seeing. There was. There was. Oh, yeah. okay, cool, cool, cool. That's what I was wondering. Is it looks like a very open space here? Like it doesn't. Look I like think it's yeah. Box. I think it was like a, ca oh, a cage almost <clears throat> in the middle of a big space. So, if you want this guy to eventually run your organization, why are you locking him up? Oh, no, no. They said they gave up on that because he was oh. too he was too out of control. His yeah. powers were too we'll dangerous. We'll more about okay, okay, what okay. happened in a minute. So he was very, very dangerous, and that's right. why they put him here. I'll let you continue then. Part five, I've just called Dylan. Jesse heads back to Central Executive, where Dylan is waiting for her. He's willingly let himself be locked in a bulletproof cell. Oh, 
it's the bald guy. It is, in fact, Sean Dury, who plays Nick in Quantum Break. It's another Quantum Break actor oh. being brought over. Yeah. Oh, God, remind don't, me who Nick was. Don't even start with your it's the same person. It's it's, the, he's the taxi driver from the start that becomes our wee pal because you've... No, that one's, a, that one's a bit much. <laughs> <laughs> Nick's not important. Whereas... Bessie are main characters. God, Nick really wasn't important at the end of that game. I don't think we uh, saw him. I think we I think we forgot about him like, yeah. after a third of the game. I think he was technically there. He kind of hung around the swimming hall and then like he left when Beth got set sat back in time. How long has Dylan been here? 17 years. 17 years, give or take, yep. Yeah. Uh, so when Jesse finds him, he's levitating like the others taken by the hiss. She catches him in the middle of the hiss monologue. He's like, you're a worm through time. The thunder song distorts you. Egg, etc. Um, oh, he does say egg. He does say egg, yeah. Uh, and Jesse's like, can you hear me? Do you know who I am? And he opens his eyes and slowly levitates back down to the floor of his cell. You're Dylan Faden's sister, Dylan says. Do you know who you are? Jesse asks. Not Dylan, he says. Trench and Darling made sure of that. I'm P6, P6, but I'm all better now, the hiss made me better. He levitates again, his back twists, he stares into nothingness and starts reciting the hiss incantation again. It feels good to say those words, he says, completing the incantation. Just remember, you said that we're not going to get an explanation of the hiss incantation in this, but we will in the DLC. Yes. It feels good to say those words, he says. I want to say them. Don't you want to say them too? Jesse reaches out to Polaris and mentally asks her to try and get the hiss out of his head. But before Polaris can respond, Dylan's voice echoes out. And there's almost like a reverb on it, like an echo on it. You, he says, as if he's staring at Polaris. And then louder in the voice of the hiss. You! Pure rage explodes from him, engulfs the cell in red light. We found Polaris together with my sister, he says, when we were very small, in ordinary, he sneers through the glass, in the desert through the door opened up by the slide projector, but she didn't help when Trench took me away, she didn't give me any powers, all of my powers are my own powers, and she didn't help when we were locked up here for years, the Bureau brought the slide projector back here, with me, and the Bureau did what the Bureau does, they used it, and they found... They open the door up to the hiss. That's the only thing I can thank them for. Jesse thinks that she needs to find that slide projector. I like how, by the way, he calls it the hiss, which means that this is an official, like it, it is an official name. Well, the name yeah. the name came to her. It could have come from, uh, what's the, what voice in her head? What's the, the thing? Polaris. You know, Polaris presumably knows who the hiss are because the hiss knows Polaris. Um, Maybe. Polaris is the name of like the, the star, as in the star, right? Just to keep you up to date with that. Um, but yeah, so Jesse's like, right, I really need to find that slide projector. If it's the reason the hiss have broken into the FBC, I need to destroy it. That's her thought. So Dylan thinks that an earworm is a tomb you can't stop humming in a dream. Baby, 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 yeah, he says. I welcome the hiss. I let it in. It set me free. Polaris is using you. The Bureau is using you. You are a puppet. You must see the truth for yourself, Jesse, sister. Go to the Prime Candidate Program in the containment sector. It's open for you now. We've opened it. Jesse agrees to go if it'll help keep Dylan calm, but before she can set off, Dylan stops us. He has more to say. A lot more. I'd like to tell you about a dream I had last night. Dylan says. Uh, I'm not going to do it because it'll get grating, but the whole time he's in that sort of dreamy sort of sp speaking every time. Yeah, it gets a lot after we're doing monologues here, so. I'd like to tell you about a dream I had last night, Dylan says. I was back in ordinary, but it was just me. I was an only child. I was a girl. My name was Jesse Dylan Faden. Have you ever noticed that about our names? They could be girls' names, boys' names, could be anything. Don't you find that weird? And then the hiss takes him. Some more hiss monologue bullshit. Later, he comes to his senses. Dylan would like to tell you about another dream, he says. I was going to be the new director of this place. I helped you get a job here so we could be together. You were an office assistant. It stayed that way. Forever and ever. It was nice. But then the dream shifted and none of it was real anymore. It was a game. We were in a game. And it was a fucking boring game. But you can stop playing. And then the dream shifted again. And in this other dream, it was more like a musical. This is an ordinary song about an ordinary girl from an ordinary town. 
She worked an ordinary job. And he goes on and on and on and on. And then he loses his train of thought as he's singing and he goes, something, something, something. That's all I can remember from that dream. If you come back to him later... You doesn't can... sound too earwormy if you forgot it. No. <laughs> you, can, you can ask him questions at any point, but for the sake of this, I'm just cramming it all into one conversation. So, come back to him later, he'll tell you about another dream he had. This dream felt very real. Maybe it's all a dream. Maybe it's all real. I was in a dark place, and there was a dark man there. His name was Mr... Oh, please remember you're about to say scratch. Door. His okay, name was okay. Mr. Door. What's another name for a door? A hatch. Mm. And he told me the chase. He Yes. I'm telling you right now, you're pulling that face. That is exactly what he's referencing. Is that him? A million percent. One million percent. How? Because it's the... Okay, right. So Does he say more to... Him? His right. name was Mr. Door. He told me that there are many worlds side by side, on top of each oh. other, some inside of others. In one world, there was a writer who wrote a story about a cop. In another world, oh. the cop was... In another world, the cop was real. So he's just referenced Alan Wake oh. and Max Payne there. So they can be in the same literary universe, but they're in, they can be in parallel universes w within that. Maybe. Door said he himself was in all of them at the same time, endlessly shifting between them. Okay, that's, that's fair. That's pretty explicit. Pretty that's, explicit. That's fair. So my thought is, again, the... Well, I'm, not gonna, I'm gonna finish the monologue. So I asked how I could reach these worlds. I wanted to go there, but he didn't want to help me. He didn't like that idea. What did he know? So, uh, yeah, so that's our big conversation with Dylan. That is basically Dylan laying out the Remedy verse for us, in a sense. Sort of. Sort of. Again, more details to come when we cover the DLC. Important for me to note, Door definitely hatch. Um, also, Remedy, by the time they made Control, they were an independent studio. Yeah. Quantum Break, the rights are still with Microsoft. Yeah. Maybe this is their way of taking these copyrighted characters and bringing them in over here. He's now Mr. Door, not Mr. Hot Hatch. Mm, I don't know. I, I don't know. But um, also, maybe it's just a cute Easter egg. Who knows? Yeah. But, you know, nothing's a cute Easter egg when we're getting this deep into it. Uh, so, yeah, anyway, we're, we're done with Dylan now. He's, he's, he's boring. He's opened up the Prime Candidate program for us. That's all that matters. So, into the Prime Candidate program we go. It's more warped than any other part of the oldest house we've seen before. Office rooms have been stretched out into tunnels. This was where prime candidates for FBC director were groomed. We learned that Director Trench instructed the FBC to actively seek out power utilitarians, people who were capable of handing, handling power natural stuff like objects of power. And oh boy, did they seek and seek, but generally it led to false leads and dead ends and disappointments. That is until ordinary until they found Dylan Faden. We find another office belonging to Casper Darling. And in that office... Is he's got a lot of offices. A lot of offices all over the FBC. That guy has a hub everywhere, and he's recorded a million PSAs. And this is where they start to get really interesting. I like that he's gone full production value on every single one, oh, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, he has never been like, this is what it is. No, it's no, no, always dude. like, I have my props. Dude, dude wrote a script. Yeah. Oh. He is, that guy's, yeah, Darling is extra. These, however, are not scripted. This one I'm about to read to you. Okay. okay? As you can tell from the background, it's just a random sheath of papers and stuff, but really important to note, I think, he's still got his bow tie on. Just track the bow tie, okay, as we keep going. Okay. So, in that office is a PSA, and the PSA says, Ordinary. So much coming together in this one case. A new object of power, something we've not seen before. And the boy, Dylan Faden, prime candidate six. The sister as well, once we catch up with her, but the boy, so much potential. We're talking Northmoor level readings here. It's remarkable. Yeah. Northmoor, you might remember, He's is- the radiator. The radiator, the guy inside the, uh, the power plant. Yeah, yeah, the old director, pre-Trench. So, so are we saying that he was considerably more powerful than Trench? Arguably, yes, so, so, I believe what, so. Is this like, they, they were doing like midichlorian readings on them, basically. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but whatever tests they did, similar probably to the tests that Pope did on Jesse, we never see her do these tests. We don't know what the tests yeah. exactly are. But yeah. sound waves, frequencies, blood tests, I don't know. But um, the, the tests see that he's powerful, very powerful. So suddenly, the PSA cuts ahead an unspecified time later. Darling is like sloped up against the wall, and he looks exhausted. But he's still wearing the bow tie. There was an incident, he says. We lost a valuable member of our team today. Excessive force. But Dylan has so much, and he's just a kid. I'll take the blame. 
He needs some slack. Boys will be boys. He's exceptional and under a lot of stress. Roberts got killed. It was an unfortunate accident. That's all. Marshall needs to learn. The Prime Candidate program has a lot to see, mainly about Dylan. We pick up on interview tape after interview tape, and some of those I'm going to come back to later, but for now, I want to show you this. So, it's an office dedicated to tracking down Jessie. It seems like she's been a project for the FPC for some time. They've been trying to track her down, bring her to the FPC. <laughs> and now she's director. Yeah, they got her there. Mm-hmm. Uh, the funniest picture on this board, so it's basically like images, uh, you know, with a long lens uh, camera that, you know, they've been snooping on her for presumably 17 years, anyone listening along. And there's things like there's her in a shop from Shop CCTV and the word shoplifting is written on it. So whoever's taking notes on what she's doing, the time is written on someone. There's one with a bus. And on the, on the bus picture, someone's written destination, question mark. I don't know about America. Don't. All buses have the destination written on the top of them. Not it, necessarily. Oh, right. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> Depends what kind of bus. If it's like an intercity or something, then probably not. We know that it's a bus from Ordinary, so presumably it's the bus she took to escape. Right. Okay. Wait a minute. Does this not say Ordinary 2 Transport Service? Can you not just so, up? assumedly, Ordinary 2 Somewhere Transport Service. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and whoever took that picture just did a really bad job with yeah, the picture, so now they don't know. Yeah. But the the the, the, um, the caption says, "All these times I felt paranoid." Mm -hmm. I like this one uh, where she's going to the coffee soap, and it's just labeled <laughs> "urgent." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah, so they've been they've been tracking her for a while. Um, anyway, so we also find a therapy session between a young Dylan, maybe sixteen or seventeen, and an FBC psychiatrist called Carla Vaughn. Dylan, Carla says, "I want to talk about Jesse." What about her? I adore my sister, Dylan says. At least, I used to, back in Ordinary. I was all—I always hoped she'd find me, take me home. Casper said she could come too, to the Bureau, if she wanted to, but she never did. She doesn't care about me. Do you know where she might be now? I don't remember, Dylan says. What about any friends, family members? Do you know anyone she might be staying with? A beat, then. I'm done with this. Tell Casper I want pizza for lunch today. <laughs> and then it cuts off. Uh, there's another one, uh, another therapy session where Carla asks Dylan over and over what today's date is. And this is quite a harrowing one to listen to. It is over and over. And he's like, I don't know. I don't know. And she's like, what day is, uh, how am I supposed to know? Dylan says, there's no calendar in here. What day is it, Dylan? She asks again. She keeps repeating the question over and over. Dylan gets more and more agitated until eventually he explodes with anger. How the hell should I know? What do you want from me? I keep telling you, there is no calendar. And then a hard thud and static. So that might be the incident that uh, mm -hmm. Darling talked about. We don't, we don't necessarily know, but... Why was she asking about the thing? Uh -huh. Maybe she thought that, like, even though he's locked off, maybe his powers... They're trying to figure out what his powers are, I think. Um, and maybe it's like, are, do you have, like, cognitive awareness, you know, of mm. your surroundings outside of that oldest house? Mm. But yeah, it's pretty harrowing to listen to. Anyway, then we find a room. It's a scaled map of the town, ordinary. We oh, see the homes, oh. the school, the church, and a landfill site. Jesse looks at the model, wanders through it, reflects on how it was the dump she, Dylan, and a couple of their friends found the side projector. It's across various memos. They will learn a lot more about what happened that day. Jesse and Dylan actually had the slide projector for quite a while. It came with eight slides. At least eight that we, the fans, know of. Each slide, when put into the projector, would open a door to somewhere. Here's what the fan base currently know, just to keep you guys up to date. Right, this just all out. sounds like the motel. Not quite. Um, potentially, but I don't believe... And I don't. There might be some theories out there. I, it's not the running theory. Mm -hmm. So we know where some of these go. So slide one is called House. It led to an empty, unoccupied house with dirty wallpaper and many dolls on a shelf. It was used by Jesse and Dylan as a secret playhouse. So that's slide one. Slide two is called Meadow. It led to an empty lot with weeds, a shack, and a phone line. It was described to smell like flowers, and staying there caused vivid dreams where everything was melting. Slide three was called Temple. It was a dark, concrete structure similar to a warehouse or bomb shelter. Slide four is called Hand, or Slidescape 36. This is the slide that brought Polaris through. The others, we don't know anything about. So let's talk about slide three. I want to focus on slide three, Temple. So this is the one that's the dark concrete structure similar to a warehouse. 
In Ordinary, a couple of Jesse's classmates found the slide projector one day when Jesse and Dylan weren't around. They used slide 3, and there's just one memo that tells us what happened next. It's a therapy session with Dylan. Dylan says, Tom and his troglodytes were using the Sled Hill Cave as their headquarters. That's where they took the projector. They'd been using the temple slide. We called it that, but really it was a broken concrete thing, like a warehouse or a bomb shelter or something. Very dark. The Not Mother lived there. Oh no, I don't like that. Yes, me neither. A what? The, the Not, not mother. mother. Considering they don't have parents, I really don't like this. The Not Mother That's, lives oh, there. Oh, I'll tell you what parents. it is. It's making me think it's Coraline. That's it's The Not yes. Mother is Coraline, isn't it? Uh, so yeah, the Not Mother lived there with her babies, children, I don't know. She was feeding Tom and the others her milk. They were changing it to little monsters. We called them dung monkeys. So some lo local bullies basically stole the slide projector, went here, met this entity, the Not Mother, who also seemed to have children, and she fed these children well, her milk. The children could just be other kids that wandered through in the past and were also transformed. Right? Also potential, yeah, 100%. Uh, we don't know much more, but yeah. Tom is important. Tom is important because we learn in another therapy session that he bullied another kid in Ordinary called Neil. They always yeah. get it in the neck. Neil would get nosebleeds, so they called him Nosebleed Neil. You get it? No, I was just ginger. That's what, they, <laughs> that's what they had on me. So, yes, nosebleed Neil. Neil was bullied so much that sometimes he wished he wasn't a boy anymore. If he was something else... Sorry, friend. <laughs> yeah, sorry, Neil. It's okay, you're just taking me back to a place I don't go very often. Well, sorry, Neil, because if you were something else, then Tom wouldn't bully you, right? It's true, yeah. So, yeah, so, like, like what, a, what would you want to be? Like a bin or a tennis ball. <laughs> <laughs> well, Why those I, two? I, 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 I had a dream one time uh, that, that you were a cat. <laughs> Go and listen to the Quantum Break episode, everyone. It's very good. So, uh, yeah. As much as I've liked this game, no, not nearly as many jokes as Quantum Break it's had. Still silly, There's no, not too no, much for no. us to no, joke it's on. It's just quite interesting and creepy, mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah, so if, if Neil was something else, Tom wouldn't bully him. Well, here's another memo. It's another session with Dylan that tells us a little bit more. Dylan. It's called Ordinary Altered World Event 4A. There's like lots of memos about Ordinary. I'm not reading them all to you as memos, uh, but I've, I've taken the best ones. Mm. Jesse and me followed the dung monkeys to the cave, Dylan says. There was a lot of them. More of the kids from town had joined up. Oh, no. It was really scary. Jesse grabbed the projector and we ran as fast as we could. They chased us. I fell and hurt my knee. Jesse tried to help me, but the dung monkeys were coming. They were just about to get us, but then Neil showed up. Neil looked like a dog. Like a melted dog. But I knew it was him. Neil said a lot of times he didn't like being a boy because Tom just beat him up. I think he liked being a dog. Wow. A so, melted dog. So presumably he went somewhere, in probably the meadow, which is wow, where so everything's melting. Melty, yeah. And he wished he was oh, become a dog and he was transformed into one. Is the takeaway. Uh, but yeah. but how did he get the projector? Oh, I mean, all the kids were kind of meddling with it. It was like Jesse and Dylan's find, but and Neil was their pal, I think. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah. So long story short, right, just to keep things clear, a bunch of kids got a hold of the slide projector, a bunch of weird shit happened, an entity called the Not Mother made a bunch of the kids go feral, and through it all, Polaris came from one of the slides, Slidescape 36. She latched onto Jessie and told her to burn all of the projector slides to set everything right, to stop these feral kids. Sensible. Yeah. Um, I'm not entirely sure if we're supposed to 100% trust Polaris and their motivations, but that seems like a good call. So, yeah, um, so Jessie did just that. She did exactly what Polaris told her, burnt, burnt them. She got all of them, or at least that's what she thought. The FBC arrived in Ordinary, Jessie went on the run and abandoned Dylan, the FBC took Dylan. Darling and Trench ordered for the entire Ordinary landfill to be transported back to the oldest house. Oh. And yeah, because the whole area is now an altered world event, so everything that's been touched by this experience has been brought back oh. here. Um, they found the one slide that Jessie didn't finish burning. burning. Slidescape 36, the hand. Of course. They brought it all back. Jesse tracks the landfill down inside the containment sector, hoping to find the slide projector nearby, but it's not here. Instead, it's just another PSA from Darling. Darling sits hunched up against a wall of papers and men men memos, lost in his own thoughts. You can't see it here, but he is oh, missing the bow tie. Right. Yeah. He's just got laid. That's what's happened. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, laid, laid by his adult juice. <laughs> Dylan's a lost cause, he says. I know I struggled to see this, but we've contained him now. I wish I'd sided with Marshall back when it was just one person, but now there's so many dead. I thought his youth was an asset, but it was too much too soon. 
Effective immediately, I'm setting up a new department, Dimensional Research. I'm sending the slide projector there. That's where my focus will be now. The ordinary site remains as is. We'll be back... I don't know when. So Jessie has her next objective. I guess Dimensional Research is very important if the remedy versus all dimensions. Well, presumably the projector is... is these are dimensions, that you're going into other dimensions, right? The rules seem different in these places. 100%, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, Jesse's got her next objective. Get into dimensional research, but that's going to be more complicated than you might think. Part six. Do you have piss in your sock? I'm sorry, fuck, what? <laughs> I don't like these chapter in the titles. Desert. Piss in your sock. Look, they're always at references, that's all I'm saying. Oh, so, of course they are. Ring, ring, Wonder it's Director you. Trench on the hotline, everybody. He's oh, back, he's got something hello. to tell us. So, Trench is like, I'm averse to using objects of power. I don't want to lean on things I ultimately can't trust, but the ashtray and the cigarette, smoking there forever, they have their uses. Sorry, what? Mm. Are, we, are we trying to just say that whatever he was smoking 24-7 was an object of power? Smoking adult sticks is good for you. I mean, is the message I'm getting here. <laughs> the ashtray maze they conjure is ever is an ever-changing labyrinth that no one but the binder and those the binder invites, so the power utilitarian who's using them, can ever pass through. The things we hid in dimensional research, the things Darling studies, call for every measure of security and protection that I could bring to the table. Wait, 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 just to say... I thought the Panopticon was like the pinnacle of things, dangerous things we had yeah. away, but actually it's this. Dimensional research was like not even classified. What's a it's level basic, above it's, ba it's basically you know? just these guys that know about it. Th these guys and maybe like three researchers that are yeah, into okay. it, but Emily Pope didn't know about this, yeah. put it that way. Um, she seems to know quite a lot. So yeah, and he he was so, so yeah, uh, he's like, oh, the maze, hands down, is our strongest lock. I gave Darling and his chosen crew license to pass through the maze. Lately, I've been starting to think I should revoke that license. Mm. So yeah, so, so the ashtray maze, where you're about to see it, the ashtray maze is crazy. And in order to use this maze, he needs to be consciously smoking that cigarette. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think he was just a smoker, but the ashtray maze was something that he could buy. He bound, binded himself to, probably maybe by accident one day, just by having one finding it. But whatever cigarette is in there is eternally smoking. So I would be surprised if he picks it up, smokes it around. I mean, what? It means he doesn't have to buy more, right? And then just puts it back uh -huh. in. And oh, so the thing is, on the base, yeah, I'm, I've not got the memo here, but basically you find the ashtray, and on the base of it is it's an engraved pattern, like spirals and squares and rectangles, like this maze, almost uh -huh. like a find your way out maze yeah. and you, you can presumably the power utilitarian can re jig it to be yeah but, but we're, so we're about to see the ashtray maze this is the entrance so jesse goes and finds the ashtray maze. i see some janitorial equipment sitting outside mm. just as trench said it is a labyrinth she takes five steps forwards and suddenly the walls will shift and twist around her it is impossible to get through it is also really cool i can't show you this unless it's in motion but it is really cool you cannot find your way because the maze ch literally changes shape around you so, if she's going to get to dimensional research, she needs to get through the maze. But how is she going to get through? Well, first of all, Trench did say that he gave Darling and Co. license to pass through. They're not power utilitarians, so how did they get through the maze? Good question. Number two is... <laughs> Good question, me. <laughs> <laughs> Number two is... I will answer that question in a bit. Number two is, uh, Atty, suddenly his voice suddenly kind of breaks through the space. Uh, and he's like, Brooke, he says, contact the janitor if you need to get through. So Jessie gives a big sigh, and she's like, oh, okay, this guy. But she sets off back to maintenance, back to the break room where they last spoke. And when she gets there, surprise, surprise, Atty is absolutely nowhere to be seen. Of course. Um, he's probably off on his vacation, to be honest. So Polaris leads her um, with a flicker uh, to the corner of the room. Atty is almost like flickering in and out of reality, and she follows the sound of his humming deeper through maintenance through the Ocean View Motel until she finally reaches nowhere. That is literally what this part of the oldest house is called. It's a vast void stretching into nothingness. Columns and columns go on forever in the basement. It could be the size of a lake. No, the size of an ocean. ocean? Is that actually what said? <laughs> no, I've written that. Oh, okay, okay. I'm just being clever. <laughs> you must be furious when Chase started referencing that all day yeah, before yeah, you. Yeah. So... Jesse gets on a conveyor. I like how the one time he does it is the one that I'm not amused by. <laughs> You've worn it out already. That's oh. it. <laughs> uh, but you will spot the like trees are kind of bleeding in over the image and stuff. So that's the interesting. The biggest thing I've noticed 
is that they are specifically looking like pine trees. Mm. They're very... Very, uh, very, very kind of Washington way, State. Very Washington State looking trees. Well, he's away in his hollow, you remember. So, regardless. Jesse oh, gosh. Yeah, he's, a, a, he's in, a, in watery, isn't he? Potentially. Um, I don't know where he is. So, Jesse gets in a conveyor lift that carries her over this chasm. And as she does, a song starts to play. It's called the Sankarine Tango. It is sung by Atti. By Atti's fin- voice actor. It's in Finnish. Uh, it was written for this game. And, of course... I'm going to tell you some of the lyrics because, oh boy. So, uh, once, the lyrics go, Once I mistook an ocean for a lake, he recited the poem in the mystery's depths. He spent his life under a dark ocean. In shadows he wanders, searching his way to the light to his beloved. Oh, man. This is so explicit. Yes, it is. Bear in mind, this is all in Finnish. So unless you're looking up the translation online or are in fact Finnish, you're not going to know what this means. Yeah. I didn't know. So, yeah. Uh, so he's like, oh, forever What was your reaction when you first read the lyrics? I read the lyrics for this lore dump. Wow. And I went, oh, that's fun. And I put it in. Okay. Yeah, okay, keep going, keep yeah. going. So yeah, so forever alone, the hero travels deeper into the night. The burden on his shoulders, like a promise, would always be there. In this game, this fool will be beaten down again and again. But only a moment of rest in death is allowed, already called to return. Time shatters. A shot echoes into eternity. Yeah, a little quantum break at the end there. What's that about? So, eh. Crazy though, right? Yeah. Um... I think I, it's I, just a bit of fun. Because death, death, death's respite was what Hatch described, right? In in the states of dying, in between dying. Mm-hmm. Um, again, please go and listen to the Quantum Break episode. But the, the shifters, and he was the sort of prime shifter, were constantly in a state of looping sort of death and undeath. And there were brief moments of respite between yeah. deaths. Yeah, so is that what that's... Potentially. Again, I just think this is cute. I don't think it's like plot. I don't think you need to know this translation yeah, for Alan yeah, Wake yeah. Two or anything. But it's really interesting that it is this. Oh, explicit. I love them so much. They're they're so fun. Mm. The kind of links they go to to put awesome Easter eggs in that most people are never going to know about. So, Jesse eventually makes it across the chasm of nowhere, and the concrete columns start to shimmer and fade to trees like we saw before. And finally, Atty appears. Did you miss me? He says. Did you have piss in your sock? Jesse says nothing. What? Oh, because he mops up the piss. Some of these, well, it's not that. A lot of these are almost like they're, they're, they're Finnish turns of phrase, but they've been translated to English, so they sound ridiculous. Yeah. But, you know, most of English turns of phrase are ridiculous if you, you know, didn't understand I've the I've just context. noticed he's, he's, yeah. he's handing her a bit of technology that looks like an old Sony Walkman, and the mm-hmm. brand on it is Pony. Ah. Oh, I've never noticed that it's Pony before. That's fun. <laughs> Very unlike... The Microsoft and Nissan. Oh, yes, from, from, Quantum from, Break. from Quantum Break. Those were very explicit. They were very yeah. explicit. Yeah, no yeah. sponsors in Control, which is great. Yeah. But have you heard the audio quality on the Pony... <laughs> <laughs> on, on, on the Pony Talk woman. No, we're not doing this again. We've got enough lore to get through without <laughs> fake sponsored reads. Lord, so, brought to you by Pony. Uh, our merch <laughs> is actually in the description link below. Uh, so, regardless, uh, so he's like, did you have piss in your sock? And Jesse just doesn't respond this time. She's Good! Like, Whatever. Uh, and he continues, he goes, now, 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 bark don't make a wound, you did good. Take my cassette player, the song is a present from my friends to you. It will get you through the maze so you can do your job. The janitor always has the keys, Jesse thinks, and takes the cassette player all the way back to the entrance of the ashtray maze, and Atty goes back to his vacation. Is that a long way that you need to physically walk in game, or does it teleport? Oh, uh, you can you can fast travel to any control point at any time. Oh, yeah, cool, yeah. cool, great. Um, so yeah, so it turns out that the song is called Take Control. And it was written by our old friends Tor and Odin, the old gods of Asgard. Ah. From Alan Wake. And yes, absolutely, it's written by... The actual song is written by Poets of the Fall, the real-life band that they're based on. Uh, This is the best part of the game. It's so cool. This is the ashtray maze. Like, the doors are flipping around. The place is shifting around. You're basically a one-hit kill machine because all the enemies in here are so weak. God knows how the hiss got in. But I think the idea is that, like, a bunch of them have wandered into the ashtray maze and have kind of gotten lost here trying to find dimensional research, perhaps. Mm. We don't really know. It doesn't really matter. Do they know that they're looking for dimensional research or are they just kind of wandering? No idea. No idea. I would argue yes. What they 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 all have a goal. The Hiss is consciously trying to sort of take down the institute, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It doesn't like the FBC. Uh, well, there's something in particular it wants. Of, and it's kind of the. I'm assuming that it's kind of a, an opposite to Polaris as well. It's kind of the Hiss is, is they're sort of maybe diametrically opposed. Mm, maybe ideas. So basically, look, the lyrics of this one aren't important, like Poet and the Muse and Alan Wake. But what I will say is that the old gods are directly referencing events 
that have happened in the game. Um, they're just a lot more vague, you know, like kill the hiss or whatever, right? Yeah, it's just yeah. ridiculous. Yeah, it's, there's no hints or anything in here. <laughs> Your name is Jesse. You're the director. Yeah. Now. <laughs> well, I'm pretty sure like Jesse, the name Jesse is used at one point. So, okay. um, so it's, it's all it's all fun. But yeah, it's the best part of the game. It's really really cool. Um, they mention the oldest house. They mention Polaris. They mention Ordinary. They basically explain what happened and Jesse's time in the house so far. But if you play the song backwards come on <laughs> i love this if you play take control backwards bear in mind this is a single released by a real life band that goes on tours and things wow. if you play the song backwards it leads you to a puzzle that gives you a super secret hotline call that i cannot tell you about right now but i will tell you about later awesome. on in this episode i just want to keep you on your toes and i don't want to spoil anything but it's very fun and very cool okay awesome. so Next. Just a little thing, right? You found that out. I have no idea, but they're an absolute genius. Um, so anyway, Jesse turns on the cassette tape, puts the music in her ears, and, the biz and bizarrely, the ashtray maze opens up to her. It's no longer looping and spiralling, it's now leading her right to the door of dimensional research. Before we get to dimensional research, just want to flag Atty's line. A gift from my friend to you. Who are his friends? Is he referencing Torin Odin? Is he perhaps referencing the board? Who are his friends? We don't know. I would assume the board. Just want to plant that now. Um, because also, if, in fact, the old gods of Asgard are in this universe, they're arguably power utilitarians. Mm. They're able to wield their instruments and, and the magic of the lake and stuff to create, like, stories that come true. They managed to create a song that guides you through the ashtray maze. So well, really that's kind of what abilities. we landed on and, and when we were wrapping up Alan Wake in the DLC, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. that Alan and some others appear to be able to sort of write things into existence. We are, again, I've not really wanted to speak too much about Alan Wake in this for obvious reasons, because there, so far there hasn't been any real reference except for Tor Noden and a, a few silly throwaways, but it's not like Alan's shown up or anything. But in this context, I would argue Alan absolutely is a power utilitarian. Mm -hmm. So is Jack Joyce. So is it's the people who have the powers, mm -hmm. right? That makes sense. So anyway, uh, so yeah. It's I good. thought power utilitarians got mm -hmm. their powers from an object of power. So what would the object of power be in their context? Well, it's not always from an object of power. Sometimes it's from an altered world event. So you could argue that perhaps... It's paranormal powers, yeah. isn't it? So like the altered world event of everything that happened in Alan Wake, that's turned Alan into the... I mean, we know that. He can write stories that are coming true right now. We know he's able to do that. Um, so he gained a power from an event or an AWE. Okay. So anyway, so uh, it's all good stuff. The Astro Maze is awesome. Uh, dimensional research, however, is not good stuff. Uh, Red Sand quotes it. It sweeps through the fact there's immediately sand, sand makes Sahara. me think that that 36 like a fart in the Sahara, that, like also like a fart in the Sahara. That frame 36 is in use somewhere. Mm. So yeah, uh, sand is here. Loads and loads of it. It's it's coating the labs, the rooms. It piles up against walls, blocking entrances and exits. Something happened here. Something presumably to do with the slide projector, but what? Well, we've got a couple of PSAs from Darling and a hotline from Trench to explain. So PSA one. No bow tie. A tie this time, but it's like falling down, his glasses are gone, it, Darling is a mess. He sits at his desk with a HRA in front of him. The vests that he created for bureau members to keep them safe. His shirt is unbuttoned, he hasn't slept. I've been fielding a lot of questions lately, he says. He's clearly uh, juiced. You can see the adult juice in the corner of the room. He, as he delivers these, he's drawling and, and etc. Uh, and it's like, I've been fielding a lot of questions lately, and despite what you may have heard, HRAs are not monitoring devices. We're not tracking your movements or listening to your conversations while you're wearing them. We do that regardless of whether or not you're wearing a HRA. <laughs> think of them as a life preserver. Only instead of water, the thing HRAs protect you from is, uh, and then he smiles, classified. And one day, that classified not water might pour in, and you'll be glad you've got a HRA keeping you afloat. And if you don't have a HRA, don't worry. And then the smile drops and he goes, it'll be quick and painless. The call from Trench. This is titled Slidescape 36. We used the slide projector, Trench says. I led the expedition into Slidescape 36. They told me not to go. The director should not put themselves in danger. I told them to fuck off. I had to find some meaning in all of this. I couldn't sit on my ass alone with my thoughts, anything but that. Those who survived were deeply affected by what we found there, by what Darling brought back. It changed everything. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing remains to be seen, but I did find meaning in that desert, 
a sound like a needle drilling in, cutting through the containment suit, reverberating at the base of my skull. My whole being... Darling said it was nothing, but he was wrong. It's been there ever since, growing into a certainty, an understanding of what's at stake here, what kind of a threat is at stake here, and what must be done to stop it. So they went into Slidescape 36, brought something back. Don't Slidescape 36 right. was the hand, and that's where Polaris came from, right? Apparently, yes. Okay. Um, and it's also presumably where the sand came from. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, anyway, PSA number two, but back to Darling. Resonance is the key, Darling says, and you'll see these diagrams and Hedron is written here, right? All these, these obsessive hexagons we've seen throughout the whole game in his offices. Vibration, frequencies, waveforms, fields we didn't even know existed. It's physics. These fields alter the reality that comes into contact with them. Hedron is communicating with me. It's trying to warn me of something imminent. I've been using every known method to analyze the data, exposing myself to it. I'm seeing things and overcome by compulsion. It's not just data, it's protection. We are about to be exposed to a different kind of resonance. Hostile, viral, invasive. That's what the Hedron resonance amplifiers are for. Taking the protection Hedron can provide us and keeping us from being wiped out. PSA 3. Oh, hello. Yeah. Is that, is that darling? Casper Darling stands in his dude office. Dude is, dude is jacked. Like oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah. Matthew Pratt is like, yeah, he's properly like, good looking. Uh, but yeah, Darling stands in his office wearing nothing but his boxers. Darling. <laughs> I'm Dr. Casper Darling. Oh, no. And this is my final message. Oh, shit. Sorry for flirting with you, Darling. <laughs> oh, that made it worse. Yeah. yeah. He's shaking. We can barely tell if he's laughing or crying at this point. It's not the end, but after this I won't... I exposed myself to Hedron Resonance fully. It's... it's changing me. I've seen... I've been shown so much. Slidescape 36... He was where, shown the egg. He was shown the egg, yeah, he saw the egg crack. Um, Slidescape 36 was where Hedron stopped the spread of another... thing. It's... terrifying. I mean, really Hedron is. was a guy, right? No, Hedron is not a guy. We I don't thought, know exactly what Hedron is. I thought Hedron was one of the prime candidates. No. No, no, no. Uh, I don't actually know why you're confused by that. That's never been referenced. No. Hedron is not a person. It's a I thing. might have just made that up. Yeah, yeah don't, don't worry about it. Uh, Hedron is a thing. We don't fully know what Hedron is right now. We know that Darling, like, was obsessed with it, thought it could protect us from the hiss. Um, and it had a resonance of some capacity that was this wee sort of sound, which, which... At least right now, it seems to be implied that it is the hiss. Well, why so why would the hiss why would the hiss provide you with uh, the technology to create a vessel? Well, I don't think they did. I think that he used like the reverse energy. engineered it. Yeah, reverse engineered it to make. Oh, this. want to be clear on that? Darling, uh, Darling states and definitely believes that Hedron told him how to make the HRAs. Uh, yeah, he's like, Hedron showed me how to make them. Same sort of way that you could argue perhaps Polaris showed Jesse how to burn the sight projectors. So and you're saying this is all this is all sort of resonance and vibrations, is it? All about the resonance. Because there's a lot of yeah. sort of... So Hedron is... the, there's a lot of fun theoretical physics -y stuff about vibrations be related to, mm -hmm. you know, parallel dimensions and mm -hmm. things like that. So yeah. Hedron is very likely another Polaris type deal. Is the current implication? I'm not going because this is very complicated, so I'm not going to mess you about. That is a very good place to be right now, believing that. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um. Yeah. So again, darling, he's like in, in a frenzy, and he's like, um, Hedron stopped the spread of another thing. It's terrifying. It really is. It's another source of resonance. Presumably talking about the hiss. Trench was exposed to this other. It will now spread. I've done everything I can to stop it. The HRAs. I don't know if it'll make a difference. I won't be here when it happens. I should have told Emily more. I've been sent one more lesson. Something wonderful, I think. And then like a slow smile just like stretches across his face. And then he looks off behind the camera and slowly walks out of shot. Mm. And that's the last we see of Casper Darling as far as like that. Canonically, is the last time anybody saw him. Wow. He's gone missing ever since. And sorry, guys. We never find out where he went. 
Oh, it is it is hands down my mo- biggest frustration with the game is that we don't find out where he went what happened that's to him a, that's a good setup for two though isn't arguably, it arguably or, or maybe we're just supposed to, I mean there are theories online that he basically just like went through the sidescape into wherever Hedron and uh, Hedron came from um, you know maybe he just just turned into you know part of the frequency I don't know but that is all we get uh, you will see him again but uh, he's, he's that's canonically the last time anyone saw him just to keep everything nice and clear then before our finale, I'm just going to lay this out as crystal clear as I can so we're all on the same page and there's no misinterpretations of stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Jesse and Dylan find a slide projector. It has a bunch of slides that act as doorways to other dimensions. One of those doorways is slide th- scape 36, the hand. In there was Polaris, the Hiss, and something called Hedron. So three entities in there. The FBC brought it all back and started their experiments. Trench and Darling went into Sidescape 36, where Trench encountered the Hiss resonance, and it changed him somehow. If you're paying attention to any of the Trench hotlines as we've been working our way through it, you'll notice he's becoming like more paranoid. Like, more and more paranoid. So, like, the, 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 he was always a paranoid guy, but the understanding is the Hiss did this to him. So yeah, so it changed him. Uh, it made him paranoid. Darling brought Hedron back to the FBC to study it more, and Hedron seemed to warn Darling that the Hiss had made it out of Sidescape 36 and into the oldest house. It showed him how to make HRAs to protect everyone, and then showed him one final thing, leading to his disappearance. So Jesse pushes through dimensional research, and she finally finds it. Hedron, we get to see it. A huge multi-sided metal orb with satellite dishes surrounding it. That- Looks familiar. It looks a little bit like the countermeasure, arguably. Yeah. It does. There are also a whole ton of control beacons in here. Oh, there are. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this is one place they really didn't want getting mucked yeah. around. So yeah, so a huge multi-sided orb with satellite dishes surrounding it. It's a massive chamber, and the Hiss have followed Jesse here. They're desperate to destroy Hedron. Jesse thinks that Hedron must be what's keeping them inside the oldest house. Lockdown or no lockdown, like, the Hiss is a resonance. The idea of it, it could breach the walls at any time. So this is the one thing holding it back, it seems. Polaris goes Ape shit. Like, she's trying to connect to Hedron somehow. She desperately wants to get in there to see it. Jesse clicks. This is why Polaris brought her to the oldest house. She needed Jesse's help to infiltrate the FBC so she could be reunited with Hedron. As to the exact nature of Hedron and Polaris, this is where it gets really, really messy and really sciencey. I don't really know nearly enough about physics or how sound waves work and stuff, but again, listeners, I'm going to direct you to Game University. He's got a couple of cracking videos on it. It explains a bit more. But just so we're all on the same page, think of Polaris and Hedron. This is how I understand it. As two entities that, like, love each other, Hedron is keeping the Hiss at bay, Jesse wants to save it, the Hiss wants to destroy it. It's to, so that we can enjoy the rest of the story is simple enough, okay. right? So big fight. Jesse battles waves and waves of Hiss, the Hiss tries to corrupt Hedron, they try to make it a part of their hive mind, uh, Jesse thinks she's able to hold it back, but the numbers are too much. The Hiss penetrates Hedron. Polaris tries to go to Hedron's rescue, but the Hiss is too much, and just as Jesse flies up to help, it's too late. The Hiss takes over Hedron and Polaris. The screen fades to and black. Polaris. And Polaris. The screen fades to black as we hear Jesse's voice tremble. Hello? Polaris? Where did you go? And without Polaris to protect her from the Hiss, the Hiss gets into Jesse. You are a worm through time, Jesse says. The, the thunderstorm distorts, distorts you. Happiness, happiness comes. Egg, etc. Egg! <laughs> The screen bleeds red, a manic grin spreads over Jesse's face. And guys, the credits roll. Oh, I'm sorry, what? Uh, excuse, excuse me? Yep. That is straight, there's no other endings, that's just the end of control. The credits roll, they that roll, not the end of control. and they roll, that is not and they roll, the end of it. And they roll. Wait, wait, yeah. wait, can you roll? Wait, yeah, I, wait, yeah. go, oh, go, go back, go back, go back, go back, go back. These are funny. What do you want? <laughs> game, game director leave. Oh, yeah. that's strange. So it's almost like, oh, that's oh, I've never noticed like, that before. Is it the end of the game? No, it's like so. Wait a minute. So we got the credits, and you know, like Charlotte Randall, she played Raya Underhill. Leave, uh, leave. But leave played Frederick Lanson. That's strange. Why is leave coming up? Huh? That's weird. And now, now that there's lots of like weird text here, like frequencies that are, like bleeding into the the credit. That's strange. Uh, anyway, um, yeah, this is. Oh, I wasn't expecting this. Um, anyway, anyway, so we're suddenly we're playing as Jesse. Uh, we're not done. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Big shocker. Um, yeah, the, the the credits roll and roll and roll. It all gets very meta, um, and we're playing as Jesse in the central part of the FBC. 
Well, she's in actual office clothes now. Director. Taking her director role very seriously. So yeah, the credits bleed away, big fourth wall break moment, and suddenly we are playing as Jessie. She's an office assistant. Are we, do we oh. have? What are you owing at? That's what Dylan said. I had a dream where I was the director and you were the, and I got you a job as an office assistant. It was a game, but it was a fucking boring game. Yeah. And let me tell you guys, this is a boring bit of the game on purpose. Uh, yeah. But my God, is it boring? And we are here for a while, for about 20 minutes. You're, this is how you're playing the game. So um, did you have a question? What are the implications of <laughs> it being a game? Is, is this known in the universe that it is a game? I think it's just a cute meta thing. Okay. I wouldn't just cling crazy. to that. Yeah, yeah. I think there's enough meta stuff that actually matters to cling to right now without thinking like video games and ooh, and yeah. is it all a game and are the characters, etc. We'll save that for Kingdom Hearts 4. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't think we're getting as meta yeah. as the sort of Kingdom Hearts stuff that's happening. Yeah, yeah. Um, again, go back and watch our Kingdom Hearts lore dumps to get caught up on that absolute chaos. <laughs> um... <laughs> But regardless, we're playing as Jesse in the central part of the FBC. Employees absently wander from desk to desk, filing memos, filling out paperwork. Jesse is an office assistant, just an office assistant, not the director, not some special chosen one. She delivers mail, tidies up coffee cups, scans forms, and this is the game we play for about 20 minutes. Until a new objective appears, to deliver mail to Director Trench's office. And Director Trench is very much alive in this dream. This is wrong, Jesse thinks. This isn't me, I'm not me. We cut to Jesse now sitting behind the director's desk. Dylan stands, holding the service weapon to her head, smiling. He pulls the trigger. She falls to the ground, dead. We hear her last thoughts. Polaris? Why can't I feel you? And then she's reset, a time loop, back to the office. She delivers mail, scans forms, searches for Polaris. She sees Ati. You should keep trying, he says. You're getting closer. I know I chose a good assistant. We reset the loop, reset the loop, until eventually... A shift and answers. We see Dylan holding the service weapon to Trench's head. He pulls the trigger. Trench drops dead, just as he did at the start of the game. I have to remember the hiss. The hiss is the enemy. This is all inside my head. The hiss is burrowing in, Jesse thinks. Another shift. The same scene with Trench plays out, but this time there's no Dylan. Only Trench, overcome by the hiss, rattling off the incantation. You know, happiness comes, baby, 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 yeah, egg. This is the truth. This is what really happened. If we don't get a t-shirt that just has a egg on it by the yeah. end of this. <laughs> Um, can I offer you an egg in this trying time? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so <clears throat> this is important. So we see the same scene. Trench is rattling off the hiss incantation. He's overcome by it. And we're about to find out what really happened. The hiss got Trench first, Jesse thinks. He was the first to turn. He turned on the projector. He let them in. With Trench dead, the hotline on the desk rings. Hello? A pleasant voice rings out. This is Dr. Casper Darling. I have a classified message for the director of the Bureau. I have sad news. Hehehedron is, is, is gone now. And it's like he is, he's glitching out as he says it. But it was not a source. It was a catalyst. Do you understand? You must go to my office. The end game. It will be revealed. Jesse hangs up. <laughs> the end game of yeah. control. Thank yeah. you, guys. Yeah. yeah. So Jesse hangs up, still locked in this hissy, hazy nightmare. She wanders to Darling's office, past versions of her that are levitating with their backs twisted, babbling. It's a, it's a nightmare of her own creation. She finds a light switch and it takes her to the Ocean View Motel, where Darling has another message for her. And this is iconic. It is nonsense. Wow. It is Matthew Peretta <laughs> dancing and singing a version of the song Dynamite, except the lyrics have changed. This is the real song where they changed the lyrics. Uh, they said they referenced Jesse directly. It's like, she walked in looking like dynamite. Like, it's proper, like a proper jazzy little number. Um, so yeah, the lyrics are literally, she walked in looking like dynamite. She said, come along and boogaloo through the night. But they all know Jesse is dynamite. They're right. Anyway, with that over, uh, she pulls the light switch and the Ocean View Motel takes her where she needs to go. I don't know what this is. I love it. Again, maybe a clue to where Darling is. Maybe he's like integrated himself with Hedron, so he's trying to speak through the hiss. I don't know. I don't know what this is. Nobody knows what this is. So, you know, if you know, chat, tell me in the comments because I'm not a clue. So anyway, she goes and she enters into a black void where she sees again herself levitating but held in Polaris's grip. 
it seems like so Jessie's looking at like a copy of herself that are like what is levitating surrounded by the Polaris like resonance and the shimmer it seems like Polaris managed to save a small part of Jessie's mind last minute it's almost like she's managed to like hide away in a corner of her mind grow brighter Polaris says in Jessie's voice around one constant they revolve Hedron is dead, Jesse thinks, but you're alive, here, in me. Maybe Hedron put you in our heads when we met her. Maybe you were always there and she was just trying to teach me how to trigger you. Maybe I'll never understand. Maybe I don't need to. Trench was the first corrupted by the hiss, slowly, over the years. His need for control only made it worse. With Hedron, oh, roll credits, she, sorry, she said yeah. control. Um, with Hedron dead, the hiss tried to corrupt me too, but I'm stronger than them. We are stronger. Another shift. Jesse stands in the Hedron chamber. The hiss has transformed it. It's writhing and pulsing and red light splashes the walls. The board reaches out. Danger, it says to her. The hiss is here. Transmissions being corrupted. Jesse finds the slide projector at the center of the chamber and touches it. And like a flash, she is transported to the astral plane. And this is the very end of the game, guys. The board's pyramid hangs over a red sky. Dylan's body is suspended at its tip. Not speaking, dreaming. The hiss has taken over. The board reaches out one more time and is like, Yo, we're giving you a power up. You can do one hit kills now, but also whoops, soak in the hiss. Sorry. Uh, for the world's most infuriating ending fight. It is not a boss fight. You're fighting waves and hordes of hiss where you can kill them in one hit, but they can also kill you in one hit. And it is not fun. It is visually gorgeous because everything is bright red. Um, and you're in the astral plane just flying around like blasting them. But my mm. God, it is just a bit of a nothing final fight. And yes, yeah, silly. Doesn't matter. Anyway, Jessie blasts her way through the hordes of the hiss to reach Dylan. She presses her fingertips to Dylan's temple and forces the hiss out of him. We cut to black. Dylan lies in a coma. Jessie doesn't know if there's anything of him left in there. If he'll ever find his way back. She thinks that the portal has been closed. The big bad threat has been eliminated, but there's still some hiss inside the oldest house. I'm working on a solution with my team, my management team, but there's a long road ahead, Jesse thinks. Again, she is very accepting to this role of director of an organization that she has hated for years. I did not skip over any growth regarding that. I personally think it's far, it's a little bit jarring. Uh, people disagree with me on that. The argument is that Jessie spent her whole life searching for the weird, that when she finds it, she's never been more at home. She says at the start, I'm happy to be here. You know, uh, Yeah, but, but also... that was very explicitly creepy that she does that at the start. Uh, yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Like, not even like just, oh, that's a bit weird. It's like meant to be creepy, kind of. Yeah. But yeah, so she's like, I'm working on a team with, uh, on it with my management team, but there's still a long road ahead. And then we get a final shot of her sitting behind the FBC desk. I'm the director of the Federal Bureau of Control. We're in this together. You, and we see a flicker of Polaris. And I. Mm. And the credits roll. And that's Control. Oh, wait, no, sorry. Credits roll. And then when we come back up, because Control is a game that there's lots of side missions and stuff to still do. You still run around the oldest house doing stuff. Uh, so after credits roll, you pick up, you're playing as Jesse, and Jesse goes... Shawshank Redemption! <laughs> I should be not. Yeah, that's the movie! <laughs> that's exactly what she does. That's great. Shawshank Redemption! Yes, yeah, so that's great. You know, it was the Shawshank Redemption all along. Um, I still think it was Industry Baby. Yeah. <laughs> so that's the end of Control. Um, I've got one final thing I want to walk you through, but before I do, oh, I've got some questions for you. And I just want to get any and all thoughts or takes okay. right now. So, sure. question one is, where has Dr. Casper Darling gone? Because we don't know, and I don't have answers for you, but I do have a couple of very strong theories. I think that he's portal rat manning it, and he's kind of just in the vents. He's <laughs> he's scrolling through the yeah, backs of the yeah. walls. He knows this place is going to shit, and he's he's just scribbling on the walls. Well, he's like dynamite on the walls. There's, there's only a few options, right? The man said, "This is the last time you'll see me," right? It was kind of a sign off. Yeah, yeah. Which means either he's gone sort of ethereal into another plane, or a more depressing take, we've seen a few people, as he was appearing to have, just slowly having a mental breakdown and mm -hmm. maybe there's a more realistic explanation for why we won't see him again. He does need to be, his physical body needs to have gone somewhere. You can't just like evaporate into the into the void. That's not... Uh, yes, you can. That's not been established at all. 
I feel like we've and seen... What do you mean? Jesse, Jesse went into the astral plane. Yeah, but Jesse's a power utilitarian. Darling isn't, and we know that. Dar- Darling has been exposed to all this Hadron stuff, right? Maybe maybe Darling has unlocked some sort of True. connection with Hadron. And, and as you pointed out, sorry to cut over you, as you pointed out, when Jesse went into Hadron and was having all the hiss in fighting against the hiss dreams, that's when we saw Darling's amazing dynamite video. But I mean, his physical body can't have left the oldest house. It could have... Okay, yeah, sorry, you're right. Why? Because it was on lockdown. Was it on lockdown Nobody when that leave. was it on but lockdown when that, that no, because he, he broke it was down. On, but it was on lockdown and Jesse got in. Yeah, but Jesse only got in because Polaris Polaris had the special resonance. But he had Hadron, which has a special resonance. Hey, you're not wrong. That's fair. Um, so okay, right. So so here's here's what I think happened to Darling. Right. He said that it was his final message. He knows we know that Hedron sent him some messages of some capacity, which taught him how to make the HRAs to protect everybody. Mm-hmm. He then saw something in his final message in his boxers. Very excited about it. And wandered <laughs> off. Yeah, like almost like oh my goodness, like tantalizingly, this I've been drawn in by something. He did say that Hedron had one final thing to show him. I think, and I'm not alone in this theory, but it is not concrete. I think he climbed inside Hedron. His physical body climbed inside that big sphere at the end that blew up. Yeah. He climbed inside of it. But then when the hiss got in and it, pff, it destroyed Hedron, Hedron basically died. It essentially zapped Darling into another plane. Particularly, I think Darling is kind of everywhere and nowhere all at once now. He's everything everywhere all Why at once Why that now. one? Why, well, like, that, why sure, that sure, sure, sure on getting zapped to another planet, why is he suddenly everywhere, nowhere all at once? Well, d- d- the, the idea is just that because the frequencies can, through through the use of other altered items, like we saw with the projector, mm-hmm. we know that those frequencies can cross dimensions in using other tools. It, okay, it's, maybe it's not that he's everywhere, but I think it's important to note that he was able to call Jesse via the hotline after we destroyed Hedron. And we know that the hotline is a link between other dimensions, basically. Yeah. Yes, and that's really important. The hotline is, is, is a, it almost like picks up the final thoughts or the vibes of power utilitarians. So we know that Director Trench can communicate, so directors can communicate with us, and we know that Darling can, and we know that the board can. They're the only three people so far who've been able to it, It's pretty much impossible, right, or it's very, it's not impossible, but it's very unlikely that whatever happened to him isn't related to the connection with Hedron. It's got to be related. Yeah. I think it's got to be related, yeah. I just think that he's almost, I think he's in the sequel. I think that Darling is going to become important in the future. I mean, surely. It's got to. But You can't, you can't like, get rid of the, the main scientist uh, guy giving you the clues mysteriously and then not address it. He's also a huge fan favourite. I mean, he's in the game for maybe about 30 minutes if you combine all of his PSAs together. That's the only way you see him. I'm still I'm love. still recovering from that picture of his shoulders. Oh. I mean, really, <laughs> I can't express anyone not oh, listening I'm not, alone. We, 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 we did take a short break and I've watched the Dynamite music video probably about 30 times now. <laughs> it's incredible. It is incredible. Um, cool. Okay, so fine. D- Darling's th- Darling theory sorted. Um, second question is, what's the deal with Atti? I think yeah. he's. I think he's on the board. Uh, can I, he's on the board. I th- or I think that he is some form of physical, in this plane manifestation of the board. Oh. I think he, that's a very good shout. He's de- there's definitely a connection with the board, but I think it could be from a slightly different perspective. I think Atti is sort of like the building, like oh, a manifestation of the building. Oh, he's all the. He's that, the oldest house. I, I, yeah. I think. I think Atti is kind of. Uh, an an ever ever na- uh, an everlasting being because like he said he was going on holiday but you know he he was there as well he, he appeared to mm. us later on um, yes but I think that's particularly important he did go on vacation but Jesse was able to almost find him through the oldest house and bear in mind that the oldest house is bigger on the inside it has portals in a sense what we call thresholds I, that can lead you to other areas and planes I think of existence he is literally the, my theory is I think he's literally the caretaker in a very sort of mystical sense he is yeah. he maintains the if he's not a manifestation of the building he's a sort of magical being who is responsible for the building Which, and making sure people find their way and making sure there's a director in charge and making sure everything's running and um to be fair could also simultaneously be a connection to the theory of him being on the board because they didn't they, they go, didn't find the board until they found the house i think they go hand in hand so i think they are like the bu- hand, the yeah. bu- the, bu- the building kind of the board are helping the building to remain you know uncorrupted and are essentially running it exactly yeah 
but yeah, I think maybe they created Ati, maybe maybe he used to work there and he's become something else. What I will say is that I didn't show them to you, but you do find two or three different collectibles written by certain members of senior management throughout, and they're essentially memos to each other or other members of staff, which all have the same sort of vibe, which is... Well, there's a memo where somebody reports it to the head of security, I think, and they're basically like, Atty, I found the janitor creeping around in a classified section, and the response from the SLT member is, leave him alone, he's allowed to be in there, do not bother him. Like, very, <laughs> not, not as in like he's dangerous, just don't get in his way, he yeah. will have a reason to be there. He's more important than you. <laughs> 100%, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And exactly the concept of like, you are the janitor's assistant to Jesse, but she's the director, we always mm, tie exactly, that in. Yeah. He's got to be up uh, higher up in the hierarchy. Um, I, I agree with you, I actually love the idea that he's like a manifestation of the oldest house. I think that's really cool, I've never thought about that. I've always been on your side, Chase, thinking he's just a, a, a avatar for the board. I'm still yeah. wondering if there's a difference in saying those two things, though. Yeah, Good they question. could be yeah. very, or they're, they're either hand in hand or the same thing, maybe. Yeah. Uh, I like that we're using Avatar. Second Magnus time, I promise not to say it, but yeah. Magnus Archives. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, okay, so that actually ties in then with, I've got three more questions. Okay. What's the deal with the board, then? Do we like the board? So the board what do you think about the, the board? board? The board are sort of... They could almost be sort of fourth dimensional beings in another dimension, couldn't they? Parallel to ours. Um, why do they care about maintaining the house and, and containing supernatural events? I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, to maintain stability, they don't want the hiss coming through and messing everything up. Because bear in mind that the hiss is just one of many, potentially millions of entities. Yeah. It's, just, it's not like the hiss is the big bad or yeah. anything. It's I just one. Like as of right now, I'm indifferent to the board. Like, Fair. they've given me zero reason to be like, you're suspicious, but they've also given me no solid reason to be like, oh, you're, we're pals, we're yeah. best. Would you say throughout the game, because obviously you can't cover 100% of stuff, especially in a game where there is so much collectible side stuff. Yeah. Um, would you say the game gives you any kind of reasonable hints to what they are? Or is it just sort of, they are mystery things? Right now, no, soon. In the next episode, you might um, no, you're not going to get concrete answers, yeah. but you're going to get more board stuff. Cool. Um, okay. Love it. But for now, theory on my part is, and we didn't really talk about this at all because my god, there was so much to cover. But now that we're wrapping up with theory stuff, something to make you very aware of: um, the collective unconscious is incredibly important in control. This this it's a Jungian concept. Mm. So basically, the collective unconscious in case you guys don't know, or if anybody listening doesn't know, is belief that through our collective, we attribute properties to something. There's the community sketch that I think is, is always does, does it quite well, where he's he picks up, um, what's the name of the main character in community? Yeah. Jeff. Jeff picks up the pencil and he goes like, I could call this pencil Steve. And then, and he breaks Steve in half, the and pencil. Everyone, and, and everyone goes, oh! And yeah. he goes, and a little part of you dies, just a little bit, because you've attributed characteristics and properties to this pencil collectively. It's that idea that we all do, we attribute things to it, you know. Coffee, there's, a have... there's, a, like, there's a collective consciousness, you mean, with a, with a sort of shared experience and mm -hmm. a, a unconscious opinion. Think about the floppy disk with the, 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 the launch codes for the nukes. Mm -hmm. That is kind of how that was created, in a sense. So it was, pe people have put so a much... Psycho, a psychological awareness of of what this could do has attributed it through our collective consciousness. Has given it properties of some capacity. Right. But but also so psychosphere stuff almost, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. But you can't it can't just happen on its own. You know, it's like there's a book, say, I've got I'm looking at uh, The Stand by Stephen King. And it's not like we can attribute properties to that and it will suddenly come to life in the universe of control. Something needs to almost be the catalyst to give it yeah, magical yeah, yeah, properties. Yeah. The question now is to use that floppy disk example, that had the, the the properties of being able to give you launch, right? Because yeah. you could launch nukes using it. It had the codes on it. But there's lots of other properties you could give to that floppy disk. Radiation. Maybe it sh maybe the property it has should be that it gives someone radiation poisoning mm -hmm. because nuclear codes, right? So why is it those properties specifically? Because it works better for the video game. It does, <laughs> but but it does. But you find a lot of examples of stuff that isn't like superpower yeah, yeah. stuff. Yeah. It's silly stuff. And you think... could say that it's potentially because it's something that was utilized by the humans mm -hmm. to for those humans to perform said action. The humans weren't performing radiation. The humans were performing 
launch. Well, audience. they were performing Bomb was the main thing. Well, they? okay, I'm, I'm going to counter that then with the anchor, which is one of the, remember the big anchor with the clocks and stuff. Yeah. And the, the takeaway with the anchor is that that, pro, that that thing's magical property is that it speeds up time, potentially. Yeah. How would an anchor possibly have that sort of property? Yeah. There's probably a reason. But... I mean, is there also just, you know, the thought that maybe they're wrong about this whole collective unconsciousness theory? True. They might just be wrong about that. Let's, True, but that, what I would say is that the entire game keeps repeating that ad nauseum. It is a concrete rule. Let, of maybe one. Sam Lake isn't as smart as he thinks he is. No, <laughs> Chase. No. Let's, 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 then, let's try and apply this theory. I'm sorry, I love you, Sam Lake. Let's try and... That dude, that dude is literally Max Payton. He will fly <laughs> through the air and shoot you with two guns. Um... I, let's try and apply this theory to the lake then, which is something we've talked about as a, uh -huh. is it an object of power? Is it an event? So let's assume then that this lake, people have been drowning in this lake in this small town with this very superstitious little town for hundreds upon hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. Does the collective consciousness about the sort of superstitions around the lake imbue it now with those magical properties Probably. to have to have made it? It's now not just a place you drown. It's uh, as Chase likes to say, it's a place that noms you. Um, <laughs> yeah. Now, potentially, but by the, so, so to go back to the board, this concept of, to go back to the floppy disk for a sec, like, it could be radiation, but it's launch. Why is it launch? My belief is that the board decides. Oh. I think the board chooses what properties certain altered items have. I don't think they affect any altered world events or anything. So what, they just... Uh, they why, 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 so why they just Earth? suddenly... Why would they do, like, a, a give, give something the property to give access to the hiss, you know? Mm -hmm. Why would they have it all contained in a building? I don't think they well, necessarily. No. Well, no. So I don't think necessarily that they that the board, you know, was like, oh, the slide projector will let the hiss through. They just went, oh, okay, dimensional research, portals to other worlds. This will be handy for whatever reason, and the hiss to control. So you're that. saying that they decided that the fridge would eat people if they didn't keep looking at it. No, because the fridge didn't eat. That's really important. It's going to lead to my next question about the former then, and what you think of the former, because really important there, the fridge that ate people that had the former inside that Jesse went inside to yeah. battle the the dissenting member of yeah. the board whatever that ah, was yeah. that yeah, yeah, yeah. the only reason the fridge ate people is because the former went in and changed right. the properties of, of the fridge oh, God, yeah. uh, same with the flamingo the flamingo wasn't didn't have the properties of like eating people the flamingo had the properties that, it was, that the flamingo can control the weather right I it's absolutely forget that. so it's a plastic <laughs> flamingo it's an object not an animal and okay. and so so but that's important the flamingo right the flamingo has the properties of changing the weather it doesn't have the properties of eating people mm. but the former went in and almost nudged the flamingo to have different properties mm. so and and maybe maybe and i'm just planting this seed now because I, everything i'm saying might be absolute nonsense right but these are theories that i have we know that the former is a dissenting old member of the board. We don't know more. You might learn more soon. Mm. But we know that it got kicked out of the board. So my belief is if the former has the ability to go in and change altered items' properties, members of the board presumably do as well. And they collectively decide, right, this is going to be this. But maybe the former thought that the altered powers should be something else. I don't agree with all of or rather I don't like all of it as totally an explanation. Fair. That's fair. I, I I can fully get on board with the fact that the board has the power to modify the properties of the I don't like the thought that, you know, an altered world event happens, they suddenly get or like Skype notification, it says altered world event, Should what properties will you select? Yeah. And I, I also think I also think it kind of it totally flies in the face of the collective unconscious idea. Yeah. Which I, is mm -hmm. which is our collective unconscious imbues the properties, but no we're saying also yeah. they decide the properties. I think it, it takes away so much of the magic of this properties are being imbued by the event itself and the people mm -hmm. involved with the event. That you know, instead it's Maybe they can I them. guess you could say the board is the collective unconscious, but I don't like that either. No, no. But <laughs> no, so, so to, to be clear there, I think the collective unconscious, because there's so many options in the collective unconscious, it almost offers up options to the board. And the board goes like, oh yeah, that one then. That's they, the least they, harmful. They get a drop down menu. Maybe. I don't like that. <laughs> no, that's fine. Look, it's just, it's just a theory. Yeah, there's yeah, no yeah. there's no basis for no, it and no, you won't you, get no, one. You presented some good good evidence yeah. for it. I, I, I would be curious to yeah. hear more. I think that it's, it's it's less that I disagree with the evidence and more that just from a thematic standpoint, mm -hmm. I don't like it yeah. if it's that way. Funnily enough, you're definitely going to run into one particular thing when we cover not the next DLC, but the DLC after that, the final episode we do on this. You're going to run into one thing where 
you are going to hate a potential interpretation of it. You're going to hate this because I hate this. But we're going to get to that when we get to it. One final question for you. Just to to, 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 to warm the stove beforehand, Are do you think it's a likely potential interpretation? No, I don't believe it. Oh, good. Okay, cool. That's I don't fine. believe it kind of because I don't want to believe it. I also think that there are there's baseline to not believe it. Okay. Um, but we'll get to it when we get to it and we'll talk about it. What is the AWE that created the service weapon? Good question, yeah. Chase, and I can't answer that right now, but I do oh, have an answer. an answer. I think we did talk about it earlier that it isn't like the others. I think we did kind of cover yeah, that. Yeah, we, we did, but I want to raise it again yeah. here while we're talking about it. It's a great <laughs> question, and actually thank you for that, because it should be my questions, because you will find that out before we finish, not this episode, okay. but the next episode. Because assumedly the board created it. So is the board an AWE? Question mark? Mm -hmm. It's very interesting, the service weapon. Um, you're not going to get all your answers, but you're definitely going to get more information about okay. what that deal is. Yeah. So with all of this said and done, right, we're done with control. I just wanted to get a few questions out there to get you get you thinking. But I've got one final thing that I want to flag to you. So uh, part seven. What does any of this have to do with that grumpy writer? Well, he's um, inside an oop. He, yeah, and he, 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 did, he did himself an AWE, probably. You think he's inside an oop, an object of power? I think that... Well, the typewriter is an object of power, isn't it? So you think he's stuck inside the typewriter? No, no, no he's, he's in stuck lake. in the lake. But... Okay. okay, he's sure. stuck in the ocean. Mm. Mm. Um, and Atty's also in the ocean. Mm. But anyway, I've got a question. What the hell does this have to do with that grumpy writer? Thank you. Well, don't worry. So that you didn't get too distracted, I left out a bunch of important Alan Wake stuff that you come across in the game oh, okay. until now, and now I'm going to give it to you. This okay. is this is base game, not base game, not, not DLC. Just, I love you know how distracted we get, and so you've yeah. you've like written around that. Yeah. So, it literally would not be a modern Remedy game at this point without some Alec Wakeisms. So, are you ready? Because I'm just going to rattle through this. Yes, I've got sir. a lot to run run you through. Let's go. So, in the, in the Dead Letters sector, uh, we find this letter, and it reads, I am writing to you to inquire about the significance of dreams in relation to one's mental health. I am aware that there are many books purporting to contain the true meanings of dreams. I understand that this is not usually done, but... I would greatly appreciate your thoughts on my condition. Ever since I was young, I've had intensely vivid dreams. They only occur sporadically, but in them I witness very strange events. I understand dreams can seem real at the time, but these feel markedly different. They do not occur often, perhaps only one or two a year. Last night, I had a dream. I saw a small, empty town. It was utterly dark. There was a lake at its centre. Shadows of people moved around me, muttering odd things. A bright light woke me up. I was screaming in my sleep. My wife had been shaking me for minutes before I woke. Because of this recent incident, I have decided to seek help. The doctor says I'm physically fine, but I wanted to consult your expertise. Thank you for your valuable time. Yours very sincerely, <laughs> Richard Boker. Is that meant to be a name we know? No, the name is not what we're meant to be known, but... He describes something really interesting well, in his yeah, dream. Well, yeah, sure. He, yeah, he describes Alan Wake. But yeah. did you read this letter in past? Because this feels... No. no. Very familiar. No, I have not. Okay. Did, did you have I'm a dream about it? I, I, may, I may have had a dream <laughs> about it. I also so, yeah. dreamed about cats. <laughs> Go watch um, the Quantum Break episode. Here's a really weird one. We find a whiteboard. A whiteboard that documents... A shoebox. Mm -hmm. A whiteboard that documents FBC research into a shoebox. A shoebox taken from the town of Ordinary, where Jesse's from. You will see that it mentions the contents of the shoebox seem to belong to a Mr. Thomas Zane. Oh. And the researcher hypothesizes that, gasp, it might be connected to the Bright Falls AWE that is written okay. there. Wait, so, wait, I'm remembering Thomas Zane, who is that? Thomas Zane is the original, uh, the, the, poet. the, the poet, original poet, who that's we kind right. of, who we kind of theorized might be Scratch getting out of the lake, cool. but, but Thomas Zane had the torrid sort of heartbreak with, uh, with the bat, with what's her name, with Barbara Jagger, yeah. and the shoebox was in the possession of the woman writing the blog, correct? Yes, it was. Yes, this House of Dreams, the blog yeah. that we looked at. So this is presumably where the shoebox went for, came, uh, came from. They took it from the woman and they brought it to the FBC. And they've been studying it. Yeah. So yeah, just interesting. Oh, the blog is specifically mentioned. The blog is specifically mentioned in control. Here it says on the board, blog, this House of Dreams, uh, FBC much. alerted. Very much. Confirm that that's um, as if it wasn't already. The one that I want to specifically, when they're saying they created an AWE in the lab, 
and were able to make more shoe boxes. Mm. What's really interesting is... So they can make AWEs. So this is... Chase, you flagged something really important there. Yes, because bear in mind, they have objects of power that have certain but properties. The shoe boxes can't be altered. The contents are always safe in the case of these AWEs, which yes. I think I remember from... the sh There was a shoe box in... Con in Alan Wake? With At the, the very, very end, yeah, the clicker. Oh. clicker yeah. And then the last note on the board says, who took the shoe box? We are in the middle of a test here. Bring it back, idiots. Why yeah. do they care? You can make more shoe boxes, no, apparently. Not the, same, not the exact same one, though, right? Yeah, so, the, so really important there. Chase has kind of flagged something important, which is that, yes, the FBC do experiments using objects of power. In this yeah. case, they have an object of power, presumably the clock that duplicates itself or something, yeah. and they're using that to give other objects properties similar to it. So they used the clock, for example, to duplicate the shoebox, but all the copies of the shoebox did not have the contents inside. Yeah. The contents never changed. Yeah. Really important. Uh, we're never really going to get deeper into this. But, but what's really that. interesting is this explicitly links mm. Bright Falls and Ordinary. On the right-hand side of the board, you've got written uh, reference Ordinary AWE 2002, and then right below that, reference Bright Falls AWE. So they're exp in the eyes of the, the, the Institute, they're explicitly linked. Yeah. Um, because we're also not done, so we've got some more memos for you. I'd also like to, specifically, Bright Falls AWE, 1970 summer and 2010 fall. Mm. So, so that was the Zane, Zane, Zane instant in the wait. 70s. And then, yes, yeah. definitely. And if you remember, well, potentially um, potentially Zane, but more likely probably the old gods of Asgard. Remember in the 70s, oh. they were running rampant with their music. Yeah. They, they caught, yeah, yeah. So, so it's probably... So I, there's potentially a third one that the FBC doesn't know about, the original one with Zane. I think... Potentially, and, and I might be wrong on this, but I'm pretty sure the 1971 is the same one. Well, I'd imagine... It so happened at the same time, almost. Like, yeah, Barbara Jagerson, uh, a sort of older woman in 2010, mm -hmm. right? Well, she's a sort of spectral figure, but... Um, yeah, it, it it would make sense that it's about 1970, right? And, like, they all knew who the old god, gods were at that time, so yep. it could be the same one. But they've, they've literally written, I've just seen, connected AWE's question mark. Yeah. So, shoebox. Had this House of Dreams confirmed, canon, Bright Falls AWE, canon, right? Explicitly referenced. Do we know who wrote House of Dreams at this point? No, we don't. Uh, so, no, nobody's coming out and said, that was me. No, no, no. We, uh, we know her name, right? Uh, I, I met the real person. Oh, I see. Oh, it was probably Sam Lake. At okay. this point. And I want to note as well, underneath Samantha Wells on this whiteboard, it says repopulation ongoing in the town. They're talking about Ordinary because that's where she lived. And remember, we learned that back during 2002, the Not Mother and her gremlin things yeah. just massacred the town and Jesse and uh, Dylan managed to send it back using the projector. So what I'm hearing is, uh, Ayo, they, they banging in that town. They banging in that town! Nice. Nice. Yeah, now we know where Darlin is, am I right? <laughs> oh! Oh, dude, fuck. <laughs> Stupid. Anyway, here's another memo. Uh, so here we go. An unconfirmed threshold manifestation at Cauldron Lake, Washington, resulted oh, in a fictional story written by the author Alan Wake, creating an AWE in which reality was altered to match that of the story, oh. though only locally and only for a limited time. Okay. Mr. Kirkland. Yes, Chase, you got a question. Alan Wake created an AWE. Yes. Using the typewriter, using his manuscript, the AWE was the, his story coming to life. That's been called an AWE. That, but that means that... So assumedly there was already an object of power in play that was then used to create a secondary AWE. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because, yeah because you, yeah, you, exactly. you can't say that a magic event happening mm -hmm. was the AWE. The AWEs create the magic events. Yes. That's chicken before the end. No, 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 no. An AWE chicken. is just an altered world event, yeah, right? But, that, but those are, those have thus far been always listed as like kind mm -hmm. of natural just happens. They're just events that happen. Not magical. They create the magic. Not na Yes, yes. But also it's important to know that uh, an alter world event is t na not really like a natural disaster. Normally an entity creates an alter world event. In this sure, case, the dark. Present. But not a magic one. <laughs> Well, the dark give presence. me give me an example of another altered world event created by a magic thing. It was always no, I, I do, I do, I do. Ordinary. The Not Mother was the entity that created the AWE in that situation. She came through. She caused carnage. That was the event, and it was the object of power that brought her through. Much like in this case, exactly. no, no, no. But much like in this case, the object of power is being used to create an altered no, world no, no, event. But, but that's my that's my point. Is that there is a an original... Alan is the an Alan is the entity, arguably. But there, but that's that's that's, that's my point. Is that. This was one spawned, like, all, this altered world event was only created because of an oop. 
But where? How was that oop created? Well, the, the, there was already the there was already the dark presence and the lake. And the yeah. lake was already magical. There was already a bunch of the dark presence intense. touched the typewriter and gave it the magical properties. So that and to, and Tor and Odin, Tor and Odin had already created altered world, an altered world of film. Regardless, Chase, I think the point you're missing is right. This concept of a threshold, I think, is important. Cauldron Lake is a threshold. That's what they're saying, which is a magical place, basically. So you've got objects of power, which are things, you've got alter world events, which are things that happen, and you've got thresholds, which are magical places. The lake is a threshold. And that terminology is presumably going to come up quite a threshold is interesting because it once again gives the idea of on the edge of something else, like a like a dimensional gate. Mm-hmm. Which and makes sense, because Alan is basically could be said is in another dimension, stuck in another dimension. Yes. yes, and before I continue with this memo, I also want to flag very quickly, I also want to flag this concept of thresholds. The oldest house has millions of thresholds inside it. Again, it, mm-hmm. it could go off. The Black Rock Quarry, you go downstairs and it's suddenly it's nighttime. That's a threshold. They're yeah. weird, magical spaces. Yeah. You can travel to them through the oldest house, but particularly you travel to them through... The what? motel. The motel, absolutely. Any, any ones that are like really far away, basically. Yeah. And so potentially the Ocean View Motel can link you, you could walk to the motel and you could end up in cauldron lake if you wanted to is the supposition here i want to raise one mm-hmm. sticking point for me assumedly this being here as the bright falls ABW that specifically mentions and confirms alan wake mm-hmm. confirms this to be in the same universe yes we is. all we already knew that but but where i have issue is this would have happened before they had opened the department of dimensional research and mm-hmm. Delon specifically mentions Alan Wake is from a different dimension. Delon. Dylan. Dylan. Delon. He d- no no no. Yeah, I, I see what you mean. Okay, so what I will say number one is dimensional research were not the ones investigating Alan no, Wake. No, 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 you no, will find out no, who was. That's, that's fine. My 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 point being with that is they didn't know about dimensions yet. Well, it's not so much they didn't know; they weren't researching it. And also, you can just make up. Dylan knew stuff that no one else knew. He had access to Mister Hatch. He is magical, mystical, superpowered. But, but no, 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 no. But this this shakes the foundation that we laid earlier about the Remediverse being parallel dimensions. Oh, it does. Because if this isn't a parallel dimension, right, to be fair. because he said Hatch was like, mm-hmm. Hatch is connecting all of mm-hmm. these mm-hmm. parallel dimensions like Alan Wake and Control. Mm-hmm. So this is like, oh no, they're not parallel dimensions. It's the no, same no, no, dimension. No, 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 no. To be fair, I was always under the impression, the impression I came into Control with was that Control and Alan Wake are in the same Earth, same the same exact plane of reality, and that Quantum Break is in a different but dimension. Yes. Which, is, which is what the Hatch... Which is what the hatch appearance kind of gives you the impression yes, of. Yes, but that's, that's not Chase. what Dylan said. <laughs> no, he well, no, no, he said. But he Alan agrees. is in a different dimension. He's in the lake. That's Chase, you're completely dimension. misunderstanding what Dylan said. No, I'm not. No, you are. <laughs> Dylan said, "I can go back in the script and I'll find it if you want me to." But Dylan said that he had just had dreams. That's all he did. And Hatch just said that there are worlds that were on top of each other, side by side, inside each other, worlds upon worlds upon worlds. I'm gonna go back and read it later because I can and almost also, guarantee that also, he said. Alan was in one of those worlds. Alan, Alan is, was is in one of those worlds. He's, he's, he's in no this world. In Earth. But he specifically said that Alan wrote Max Payne in one of those other ones. Well, yeah, there are multiple mm-hmm. worlds, multiple Alan mm-hmm. Wakes. No, no, no. No. Alan wrote about a, f- a, a, a crime writer, a detective. We just went, oh, Max Payne, that's fun. But what he wrote was Alex Casey. Yeah. And the joke, the running gag almost is like, oh, Alex Casey, Max Payne, maybe they're the same oh, okay, person. Okay, okay. In another world, the, 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 the crime fighter, the detective that Alan wrote about, the cop, he was That's real. real person, That's yeah. what Dylan said. So Dylan could go, yeah, in another universe, there's a Max Payne, I guess. It's just a, it's just a little Easter egg. Don't cling too much to the Max Payne thing. We haven't even talked about Max oh, Payne. I wasn't even clinging to Max Payne. I was just clinging to the cop and story. Yeah. I just forgot that he was written and named out. But, but we're not... But, look, you're, 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 things you're saying right now are about to get, in, th- are about to get answered. Fine. So let me continue, right? So, back to the memo. So... Mr. Kirkland, the head of investigations, they were the ones investigating Alan, the investigation sector. He was alerted on September 13th, 2010, by ex-bureau agent Frank Breaker. Mm. Who is Frank Breaker? Do you remember? He was the, the crazy dete- the crazy FBI guy, right? No, that was Agent Nightingale. Nightingale. Frank Breaker has a daughter. 
Sarah. Sarah Breaker. Sheriff Sarah Breaker from yeah. Alan Wake. Yeah. This is Frank, her dad, who you remember in Alan Wake, Sarah told Barry to call a list of names, one of which was Frank. Okay. And presumably Frank's first oh. port of call was to tell the FBC that, hey, there's an AWE happening again at Cauldron Lake. So he was an ex-bureau agent, her dad. So that's it. That's that's kind of just a fun little tease, but there you go. Interesting. Um, so yeah. So he he told the FBC that there was an AWE, blah blah blah, and referred to events investigated in 1970, 1976, and 1978. So we have three AWEs potentially that before happened in the 70s Alan Wake happened. before Alan Wake. One is Torin Odin. One is potentially Thomas Singh, and another one we don't fully seem to know about right now. Mm. Okay. Breaker had received a call from Barry Wheeler, as we just discussed. So, an Alan Wake's literary agent. So, it's nice to have a bit of Barry popping in. Anyway, a Bureau field team arrived at the site two days later, only to confirm that the event was over. Interviews were conducted. 76 and 78 were both torn. It says later. Yeah. Cool. Ah, sorry, yes. Interviews were conducted. Refer to the 1970 file, Thomas Zane, 1976, 1978 files, Odin Anderson, Tor Anderson. So yeah, Odin and Tor must have done it twice. (laughs) Good job, guys. Love those guys. So Alan Wake uh, was believed to redacted, again, it's so redacted, these reports, but was believed to redacted instigator. Probably Alan Wake was believed to fight back the instigator, you know, stop the AWE. Um, eyewitness reports highlight an old light switch, possible object of power that redacted missing. So that went missing. Wake, so that we can't find the clicker. We don't know where that is. Mm. So Wake was not found at the scene. Reports claim he dived into the lake, but no body was recovered in the search. Mm. Okay. Okay, so that, that's, we kind of know all that, but it's just making it canon. Luckily, however, this memo does come with a supplemental. Alice Wake, Mr. Wake's wife, was found during the Bureau investigation. She was interviewed and evaluated. She showed signs of severe mental trauma in the form of memory loss. She was later directed to treatment. It was concluded that she had been trapped in the threshold during its manifestation. So she was trapped in the lake. We know this. So, to to go back to my terrible rambling uh, adult-juiced theory, sorry, at the end of Alan Wake, the he turned back time or deus ex machina or whatever the, the idea is that no no alice was always trapped in the threshold yeah. so alan didn't undo that with his writing yeah. that w- i was wrong in saying which that. i think is what we said yeah. Yeah. i think yeah. we disagreed yeah. with you <laughs> I, was, I was a total idiot when i said that i don't know why i did but there you go so notable individuals still missing after the bright falls event are fbi special agent robert nightingale so he didn't work for the fpc nightingale yeah. he did work yeah, for yeah. the fbi and dr emile hartman scumbag Yes. Refer to The Creator's Dilemma, um, uh, Hartman's book, and the file The Cauldron Lake Lodge. Cool. Bureau researchers believe this event was the result of a forceful perception... Hartman died? Like, didn't we watch him die? What we watched... No, no. What we saw was... Uh, uh, inside the lodge, Alan, remember, he locked Hartman in with the dark presence and heard Hartman mm. scream, mm. and Alan smiled and walked away, given he because oh, he hated Hartman. Yeah, 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 we yeah, didn't yeah. see him die. Okay. This is important because it kind of starts to establish more about Alan Wake's rules, his writing rules, and how they work in this universe. So, Bureau researchers believe this event was the result of a forceful perception of subjective reality stemming from Mr. Wake, overlapping on our own. Wake has been flagged as a potential power utilitarian. Mm -hmm. See the Prime Candidate program file for more details. So they saw this and went, oh, he might be a good director one day. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting. Do they just see every power power utilitarian as a potential director? They definitely do, yes. Okay. Yes, yes, they definitely do. Anybody who can can interact and use these objects. We're going to kidnap you. Yeah, pretty much. Um, but that, that idea, again, if we go back to like the unconscious, the, the collective unconscious, Alan almost has had the ability through using the typewriter and all that magical nonsense, he, and, and through harnessing the power of the lake, yeah. he was able to almost make his unconscious reality. So again, it all ties in with the collective unconscious concept a bit, yeah. except it's not collective this time, it's his, his unconscious. Well, I suppose you could, you could make an argument that it's, it's not collective, true, it's all coming from his brain, but... There are things in there that are influenced by other people's thoughts in the sense that there are things in there that he didn't want or expect or 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 because you know they were influenced by the things or people that he'd interacted with. It's a good point. I think it's really interesting though that if it's all his consciousness, there's still the rules of the lake that are dictating it. Mm-hmm. So is it the threshold and Alan's powers fighting each other, or what is it? In 2011, a book by Clay Stewart titled The Alan Wake Files, which we discovered discussed way back in the Alan Wake episode, it was a little collectible you got with a limited edition, was published by Roundabout Press, New York and Olympia. Agents interviewed Clay Stewart and suspected minor power utilitarian sensitivity, okay. which makes sense because Clay Stewart can almost dream walk. He's been able to walk into dreams and speak to people. He was placed under indefinite surveillance. So the FBC are just keeping a wee eye on Clay. Again, 
I don't think it's that important, but Clay, Clay, Clay's about. A monitoring station was established at Cauldron Lake to alert the Bureau of any future activity. Awesome. So they now have a base of operations there. Yeah, Which it. presumably will be how Control and Alan Wake 2 get linked. No. Then we find this coffee thermos in the Panopticon. A, a connected memo reads, a blue coffee thermos with a white plastic cap and a logo of the Oh Dear Diner, located in Bright Falls, Washington. Oh, yep. Uh, the item responds to Formula I-16, which Formula I-16 is one of the incantations. Remember when we talked about the Christmas tree? Yeah. And how they, they came up with, like, using the Christmas tree, they came up with incantations that made certain objects kind of respond to it in certain ways. We don't exactly know what those responses are. We don't learn that. Is this an oopers? Is this an altered item? It is an altered item. Cool. cool. So it, it doesn't have any powers or anything. It just seems to be. It might. It might do a little dance when you do incantation. <laughs> Pretty much. Um, so yeah. Um, so this item responds to Formula I sixteen. Yet no discernible altered effect has been discovered. So the only thing that really happens is, bear in mind, the way that they report back on like whether or not something responds to it is it's all about frequencies again. So yeah. maybe like the frequencies spike when it hears it, but it doesn't seem to do anything. Yeah. Um, it's just there. Um, so yeah, other than keeping liquids warm for surprisingly long periods of time, it's also worth noting... That I think that that's just the surprisingly good build quality of the <laughs> Oh Dear Diner <laughs> uh, It's also worth noting that the coffee from the thermos is always refreshing and strong, no matter its quality before being poured into the item. As is all coffee from the Oh Dear Diner. <laughs> what poor research assistant is drinking out of altered items? <laughs> Okay, I've put two scoops of Kenko in there. Wish me luck. Tell my wife I love her. Okay, we've got a couple left. I forgot left. to put in the sugar. <laughs> oh, never mind. It's perfect. We've got a couple <laughs> left, and they're about to get a little bit weird. So, in the Prime Candidate program in the game, we stumble across a tape recording of Jesse in therapy. So, the therapist says, Last time we spoke, you mentioned a poem by Thomas Zane. Yes. And then Jesse quotes the poem. Beyond the shadow you settle for, there's a miracle illuminated. I looked up the poem, the psychiatrist says. Only, I couldn't find any poet by that name. I did find another Thomas Zane, a European filmmaker who moved her, who moved here in the 60s. It's interesting. No, Jesse says, that's, that's not true. Thomas Zane is a poet. He's, he's one of my favourite poets. Perhaps you wrote it yourself, the psychiatrist suggests. I didn't write it myself. Jesse replies firmly. So Jesse knows and remembers Thomas Singh. So remember, most people gone for Barry couldn't find any reference of him, but Jesse knows who he is. This psychiatrist, however, did find a European filmmaker by the same name. Mm. So there's another artist called Thomas Zane. Who was who around films. in America at the right time to potentially. And I didn't cover this with you when we looked at the Alan Wake Remastered Edition, but there was one change in the Alan Wake Remastered Edition. So at the very beginning of the game, during Alan's nightmare, when he when he meets Clay Stewart and he locks himself inside the cabin and Clay dies outside, inside that cabin is a poster on the wall of the diver suit. And it says on the poster, Tom the Poet. It's just dream stuff. It, it doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. But if you play the remastered version, that poster changes to Tom the Filmmaker. It doesn't say poet anymore. It says Tom the filmmaker on it. Mm. In the remastered version. Almost as if, for some reason, Tom's artistry has changed. He's now a filmmaker. I have no explanation about this. And we're going to get even weirder with it when we cover DLC yeah, stuff. Because I have no idea what's going on there. Presumably we're going to get answers in Alan Wake 2. But for now, we've also got something else. Uh, we find this as well in the game. A standard letter size typewritten page with minor water damage. The page is full of text, but apart from the top seven lines, all the rest has been violently scratched out. Only a few individual words and phrases can be made out. The page emits a dim glow in the dark. When the text is read, there is a feeling of dislocation, as if witnessing the page being written as you read it, and as if reality was being redacted, so probably rewritten, to match the words on the page. This feeling is made stronger if the text is... Redacted. I don't know what that final word could be. Not even got a clue. Mm -hmm. Forensic and linguistic anal analysis confirms that the text has been written by Alan Wake with the same typewriter as the earlier materials discovered in Bright Falls in 2010. See the Bright Falls AWE, etc. The page was discovered in an instance of the Ocean View Motel and Casino. Oh. Yeah, why is a Alan Wake page in the Ocean View? Well, you've already hinted, you know, is, is there is there a 
way to get to the lake from the, the ocean view. Maybe. But, you know, all we know about the ocean view is you walk in and the only the only door that's available to you is the upside down no, pyramid. No, 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 no. The, 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 only, the only door available to Jesse is the upside down pyramid. So it says, the page had been pushed into the motel's corridor from under the door with the symbol of a spiral. Yeah, you hinted at that earlier, you yeah. bastard. Again, I know what two of the doors in the ocean view do. I know that the pyramid leads to the oldest house and I know kind of what the spiral is. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, Exciting. You got any thoughts right now about why it's a spiral? What the deal is there? I think we're pretty much on the same page about what yeah. that is. Yeah. What? Where does the spiral lead? Uh, to the lake. Yeah, presumably. Yes. That's that's the theory. Anyway, uh, so yeah, we can find this page in the Panopticon, and if we approach it, this happens. The silhouette of Alan Wake oh. appears on the wall behind the page. He's clacking furiously on a typewriter. And best of all, guys, we get to hear his voice. Um, he's, he's, he's so good. Again, it's Matthew Perez. It's basically Darling playing two characters, which is very fun. For 10 years, I've tried to write my escape, only sinking deeper, Alan says. I used to know where fiction ends and reality begins. Here, they're all the same. It's a hideous trap, my every thought made real. Fear, desire, how can I ever know for sure I've escaped and not just lost it in my own fantasy? That thought alone can drive you mad. And finally, finally, and I did tease you about this earlier on, if we rewind the song Take Control, written by the old gods of Asgard, the one that plays in the ashtray maze, yeah. it's all very fun and cool, we find a code. And if we decipher that code, then the game rewards us with a phone call. The hotline rings with another message from Alan. Oh. And again, we see him typing. So Alan is communicating with us via the hotline. So that's a fourth person now who can use the Definitely hotline. Definitely a different dimension, yeah. So we, he's, he's typing and we hear what he's writing on the page. The Valhalla Nursing Home, he writes. Founded in 2014 for Odin and Thor Anderson of the old gods of Asgard fame. For their twilight years, built after the return comeback tour flip-flop to be their farewell tour. It was cut short, cancelled, much to the chagrin of their agent Barry Wheeler. So if you remember, we hear about this in American Nightmare. We hear it on the radio, mm. we hear Thor and Odin are on like a radio show and they're like, We were in Golden Lake! No we weren't! Yes, we were. And it sounds like they're like, they're, they're just having that dementia time. Like they're having a really bad time of it. So this was ba Barry's response to the two old gods essentially developing like probably Cauldron Lake related dementia mm -hmm. while on tour. He became their agent. Remember he drank their moonshine. He was like, these guys are great. I actually quite like their music. I want to become yeah. their agent during Alan Wake. So this is what he did. He went on to become their agent and they went on a return farewell tour. That was what it was called. Wheeler had managed to coax a couple of hit songs out of them before that, Alan writes. Balan slays the demon, a couple of others, three massive stadium-sized gigs. The old men rocked like they were possessed by the devil. The backstage parties got out of hand. The air was thick with smoke. Wheeler squinted, his migraine flared, booze and drugs, a rock and roll cliché. The brothers ran off after every gig. Wheeler had security track them down to the craziest after parties. The Andersons were old, so old, vampires, princes of darkness. After every gig and the rampaging party that followed, it took them weeks to bounce back. And they never did completely. Each time, Wheeler expected them to croak. After the third gig, he couldn't take it anymore. Couldn't stomach the idea of another client dropping dead on him. He cancelled the tour, called it off. It was over. He set up a foundation with the money from the record sales of the Greatest Hits album and the gigs. A lot of money. Barry Wheeler was good at his job. He set up the nursing home facility. The old men deserved it. Hmm. So Barry put them, created a nursing home just for them, all Valhalla themed. Mm. And uh, the old gods are there to this day, it seems. Oh, Barry. I know. God love him. Barry Wheeler. Uh, sorry, guys, you're not going to get any Barry Wheeler uh, in any more control stuff. That's God it. damn it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm okay with that. So there you have it. That's it. You're now... F what? <laughs> you don't want no more Barry Wheeler. Please, God, no. <laughs> but my friend went in a lake. No, your friend was nobbed by a lake. <laughs> I don't know nothing about none of that nothing, nothing. I hate this. So yeah, that's it. Uh, we're done. That's everything I have to show you. Uh, oh, no nothing man. else. Uh, yep. Yeah, so that's it. You're this, now fully caught up. For this this has gotten so up my You're street. Not. Yeah, you are. You filthy liar. What are you talking about? You filthy liar. Why am I a filthy liar? Because there's two DLCs. 
Ah, uh, DLCs don't have anything to do with that in week. Oh, of course they don't. No, they don't. Well, nah. I'm sorry, everyone. You'll have to wait until next month for the DLC, unless you're a patron uh, to the Monty Zander channel, in which case you'll be getting those a little bit early. A little bit early. Um, but for now, here's a little tease of what we're covering next time. The hiss got in. The foundation is overrun. I was out of time and out of options. I took all the C4 I could get my hands on and strapped it to the nail. Boom. What was your favorite part oh of that tease? Oh god, I'm horrified! Oh, I'm aroused. <laughs> I don't know how to handle this impending doom! So, uh, yeah, thanks very much for listening, and uh, we'll see you next Thank time. Thank you, everyone. Bye! Bye-bye.